and hear what Wayne Bennett has to say about Brad Fittler's shock rugby league comeback. Brad Fittler's shock comeback for the NRL Nines next month has caught the attention of master coach Wayne Bennett. Fittler retired in 2004, but he's set to play again for the Roosters at the ripe old age of 42. Bennett was criticised last season for recruiting too many old players. He nearly fit into our recruitment plans here because we like those older players. He's probably a little bit young for us yet, but another year or two on him, I think we could probably bring him here to the Knights and if he doesn't make it in the Nines. 32-year-old Clint Newton is Bennett's latest veteran recruit. Renowned teetotaler Wayne Bennett thought he'd woken with a hangover to news Brad Fittler will play for the Roosters in the Auckland Nines tournament. The 41-year-old legend's comeback isn't being taken seriously by some NRL rivals. Yeah, well, I woke up and I thought I had a New Year's hangover for a start and I thought um, maybe I'm just uh, a bit seedy today. And then I thought a little bit more about it and I thought, well, he nearly fit into our recruitment plans here because we like those older players. He's probably a little bit young for us yet. <laughs> In Brisbane, Ben Barber endured a punishing return to pre-season training. New recruit Stuart Mills collapsed, suffering dehydration. Yes, occasionally, Fergo, you can get that odd gold nugget from uh, Wayne Bennett in a press conference. Tonight, rugby league player Russell Packer locked up for two years over a drunken Sydney assault. NRL player Russell Packer has been left shocked after being sentenced to two years jail over a drunken assault in Sydney last year. A magistrate described the attack as cowardly and deplorable and said the 24-year-old was lucky the victim's injuries weren't far worse. John Hill was in court today and joins us now. John, how did Packer appear as the sentence was handed down? Well, he was visibly shaken. The magistrate said this was a vicious attack and that the, uh, the young fellow, the victim, was left with serious facial fractures. The sentence, he said, was designed to send a strong message to those who might get involved in alcohol fueled violence. 24-year-old Russell Packer wasn't expecting to go to jail for the vicious assault of a man in Martin Place last November, but the footballer looked stunned as he was led from the courtroom in handcuffs to begin a two-year fixed sentence without parole. Magistrate Greg Grogan said Packer was heavily intoxicated when he attacked the victim, Lester Time, outside Chambers Hotel in the city, punching him in the head several times, then stomping on the man's face as he lay unconscious. Mr Grogan said this court and this community are sick and tired of alcohol fueled violence. Packer's lawyer said the footballer had an alcohol problem and was in a rehabilitation program set up by his new club, the Newcastle Knights. The Knights were hoping to have the Kiwi forward playing this season after his move from the Warriors, but so far the NRL has failed to register his contract. The magistrate said Packer was being held accountable for his actions. It was cowardly, it was vicious and it's unacceptable. He offended in an atrocious and criminal manner. Mr Grogan said the sentence was not influenced by the current media attention being given to alcohol fueled violence. He told Packer, your behaviour was nothing short of disgraceful and deplorable and you should be absolutely ashamed. There's a process in place with the appeal and uh, going forward to get the court date uh, in February and from there then we'll obviously support Russell through the process and his family, which I've got two young children. Packers partner Laura was in tears as the footballer was taken to the cells. Now Packers lawyers are appealing the severity of the sentence but the footballer has been denied bail. OK, thank you John for the update there. NRL player Russell Packer is behind bars and in shock tonight after being sentenced to two years jail over a drunken assault. The punishment also came as a massive surprise to Packer's supporters, who assumed his guilty plea would earn him a more lenient result. The Knights front rower turned up to court ready to cop his punishment. But when magistrate Greg Grogan locked him up for two years, the 24-year-old was dumbfounded. His defence team expected leniency for the early plea. Jail time was not imagined. But magistrate Grogan had other ideas. The facts are alarming. It was cowardly. It was vicious, wanton violence. 
The attack happened in the early hours of November 23. Packer and another man argued over a couple of cigarettes. Packer repeatedly punched the victim, knocking him to the ground where his head smashed onto the footpath. Packer then leant over, punched the victim once more to the head and then stood up and stomped on his face. You shocked that? I think we all were, aren't we? The court heard Packer had been taking part in what the club called the Packer Project to address alcohol abuse and anger management. Magistrate Grogan said Packer's actions were nothing short of disgraceful, deplorable. You should be absolutely ashamed. In a higher court, Packer could have faced up to five years jail. In this jurisdiction, the maximum is two years. Magistrate Grogan said a term of imprisonment was the only path. Packer's lawyer, Murigan Thangaraj, immediately lodged an appeal claiming the sentence was excessive. We'll obviously support Russell through the process and his family. That appeal is set to be heard in a month, so Mr Thangaraj applied to have Packer released on bail until then. But Magistrate so Grogan was having none of it, declaring the community had to be protected. With his girlfriend in tears, Packer was carted off and is spending tonight behind bars. Simon Boda, Nine News. Tonight, a tough talking magistrate jails a Newcastle Knights player over a drunken city brawl. This is Seven News at Six with Mark Ferguson. Good evening. NRL player Russell Packer has been jailed for two years over a late night fight where he punched and stomped on a man in the city. The magistrate showed the Knights recruit no mercy for his guilty plea, describing his actions as cowardly and deplorable. Russell Packer walked into court confident he would walk back out, but a couple of hours later the Newcastle Knights recruit was handcuffed and in custody, sentenced to a fixed two-year jail term by a scathing magistrate over a drunken assault in Martin Place. Packer admitted punching the victim to the ground, striking him again, then stomping on his face. Magistrate Greg Grogan said it could have been fatal and he didn't hold back. Your behaviour was nothing short of disgrace you should be absolutely ashamed. It was cowardly, it was vicious and it was unacceptable. Packer's face twisted with shock as the sentence was handed down. His lawyers lodged an immediate appeal. Packer's barrister said that these were the 24-year-old's first offences and said that he'd had an unrecognised problem with alcohol. He questioned the impact on the player's rehab if he was locked up. But Magistrate Grogan refused a request for bail, saying the more important question in my mind is what do we want our community to be? And there's a one-word answer for that, safe. He said Russell Packer appeared to be a ticking time bomb that night. A treatment plan developed by the Knights named Project Packer will have to be put on hold. The appeal will be heard next month. From there then we'll obviously support Russell through the process and his family, which I've got two young children. That's all I've got to say, I can't react, can't answer on his behalf. So. Were Thank you shocked though? I think we all were, weren't we? Packer's emotional partner Laura went home alone. Jody Spears, 7 News. <laughs> Rugby league to start with, and Newcastle Knights player Russell Packer has been found guilty of assault. He'll be jailed for two years pending an appeal. The Kiwi enforcer had earlier pleaded guilty to the charge after he bashed a man during an alcohol fueled night in November last year. Packer's legal team has lodged the appeal against the severity of the sentence. And Russell Packer has two years in jail to think about his drunken assault. The Newcastle Knights have officially terminated his contract. Liam Cox. 10 Eyewitness News. The disgraced rugby league star dumped by his club. The Newcastle Knights have dumped Russell Packer in the wake of his conviction for assault. A former Warriors player, Packer was sentenced to two years jail for bashing a man in Martin Place last year. Knights coach Wayne Bennett has described it as a no-win situation. Packer is appealing the severity of the sentence. Now to Rugby League. Newcastle Knights recruit Russell Packer's new year has gone from bad to worse. He's been sacked by the Knights. Last week, of course, you would have heard he'd been jailed for two years for a drunken assault. Now the Knights CEO, Matt Gidley, said in a statement today that Packer's contract had been terminated and that the only reason it had been delayed until now was because the club had been following formal processes. Now this has caused a bit of traffic on social media. Will, what are they saying? It certainly has and a lot of people obviously are saying after all this spate of uh, king hits and 
everything that's going on uh, on the streets is that's a good job. Two years is great. Glad the Knights have done it. Uh, Andrew Voss is one of those people, of course, well-known journalist, especially in Sydney. NRL Knights sack Russell Packer. Can't think of a single point to argue their decision. A lot of people agreeing with that. On the other hand, though, uh, is Cooper Vuna, who uh, now plays rugby in Japan, but has played a lot of Super Rugby as well. Good friend. Of course, he's talking about Russell. Got a two-year sentence. A bit too harsh, don't you think? Well, maybe in some ways he's a victim of all of that stuff that's going around, but people still very happy with the fact that uh, the, the heavy hand of the law has been laid down. Yeah, there has been a lot of positive response. But, Joel, uh, a good move from the Newcastle Knights. They have also said that they are going to be involved in, in helping Russell with his rehabilitation, whatever that is. Well, there you go. Look, I, I think uh, they've done everything possible they can, the Newcastle Knights, take him to the court themselves. Uh, how long can you stay with the player? They're going to follow it up. I, I think they've done the exact right thing there, the Newcastle Knights, and, and well done to them. But they had to sack him, didn't they? I don't think there was any other course of action, really. Not, no. not for anyone's sake. OK, well, we wish them all the best, though, in the future, because it's a very tough one for everyone involved, especially the victim, of course, who we cannot forget. Ten out. A set play here. You can get the party started. We catch up with Knight Centre Dane Gagai, who's gone to great lengths to improve his game this off-season. I went over to the States and um, did a bit of training at um, Michael Johnson's Performance Centre. Willie Mason hijacks the mic to get the players' take on pre-season. We find out how well halves pairing Jared Mullen and Tyrone Roberts really know each other. OK, if Tyrone wasn't playing footy, what would he be doing? Greenkeeper. <laughs> I don't know anything about him. <laughs> Hello and welcome to NRL Preseason. I'm Matt Shervington. And I'm Lara Pitt. Each and every week we're going to take you closer to your team's preparation for Season 2014. We'll introduce you to some of the new recruits, see how the injured players are coming along and also how some of the new and old combinations are coming together. Today, though, we're in the Hunter with the Knights all set to be put through their paces once again by super coach Wayne Bennett. But let's kick things off with Captain Kurt and find out how he's going after yet another season marred by injury. Kurt, you've had such rotten luck. A shoulder in 2012 and both of your feet in 2013. Where are you at with your recovery? Yeah, it's been a slow process. It's been a, a disappointing couple of years. And, yeah, as I say, just to come back from a shoulder reconstruction in... In 2012, and looking forward to, to 2013, and then um, yeah, just before Origin One, hurt my right foot, and come back for four games, and just a freak accident hurt my left foot in the same injury, and was ruled out completely for the rest of the year, and surgery from there. All right, rehab now. I'm sure you're busting to get back into it. What's the length of time you need to be back to your best? I'm really confident it's going to be right for the for round one. I, I certainly want to be a part of round one, uh, which we're playing Penrith at Penrith, so. Um, I've just got to do everything I can to make sure it's right and physio and rehab and looking forward to the start of the year now. Watching the team from the sidelines, given their run, would have been very difficult, but I guess so much to build on this year, given the success of last. Yeah, there were certainly some mixed emotions. I was really disappointed to, to be ruled out for the rest of the year because I was looking forward to the semi-finals and I could feel the momentum being built from our team in the lead-up to the semis. And, and just the feel around the town and the, uh, the, the, how much support we had from our fans. It was, you know, it sort of took us back to the 2001 and 97 times where there were so many buses getting um, taken down to Melbourne and even Sydney for the Roosters game. It was, you know, it was a great time and I think the boys really felt that. So you were there in Melbourne. Nobody expected you guys to go down there and beat Melbourne in Melbourne. They were the premiers. Did you sense that something was going to happen that, that Saturday night? Yeah, I did. I, I felt it probably even a couple of weeks before that. Just uh, the way we were playing games and uh, I suppose the, the way we were winning and the, the way we were playing as a team, I felt the, felt the momentum and the confidence starting to build through the end of the year. And uh, there was so much, I suppose we hadn't won and so, many, so much talked about that we hadn't won down in Melbourne for so many years. And they are, they're a great team. We've really struggled down there against them in previous years. But... They went out there and played their best and certainly got a great result. 
coming back this year, where do you think Wayne will put you? Yeah, I'll be, I'll be playing at hooker, I think, this year. I had a good chat to Wayne, and obviously with Bedsy finishing up, I'm happy to play there again full-time. How exciting is that for someone like Tyro? And this gives him an entire pre-season to work with Jared and really get that combination even better than it was last year. Yeah, it certainly does. I think any time you, um, you get experience in a position and you get some confidence in it, you, it certainly translates onto the field. So he's, I've, I've just seen him you know, train this morning. He's, he's confident. He's into his third year of pre-season. Um, and that just, yeah, as I say, builds confidence, builds belief in your own ability. And the coaches, the coaches showed that in him last year. And I think he, he had a, a, a great finish last year. So overall, obviously early days, but where do you think the side can do better? It's only one more step and you're in a grand final. Yeah, it was one more step. I suppose it was disappointing the way we finished against the Roosters and, and they ended up winning the grand final. They were the, they were the form team. They deserved to win it. But um, I think defensively we let ourselves down in that game. And, Wayne always does, he, he comes back to defence and defence wins games and I think that's where we'll start again this year and make sure we start um, start strong defensively and, and keep that keep that intact to keep the year off. Here with um, hard man Jeremy Smith. <laughs> How was your break mate, what did you get up to? Um, me, Alex McKinnon and Dane Gogo, I took off to um, the States for three weeks. Got away to the, the Maldives with the missus for a little while. Yeah, I stayed in Newcastle with the birth of me. My youngest. No trip to Vegas, why was that? Uh, a little less of fun by the end, I think. Just um, seeing now how you're enjoying pre-season, mate? I'm oh, loving it. <laughs> Same <laughs> as me? <laughs> yep. How are you enjoying the pre-season? Um, not very much. What's your favourite thing about pre-season and your, and your worst thing? Our favourite thing is just coming back and being around all the boys. Um, obviously the sessions are pretty tough, but it's always enjoyable being with your mates. Uh, worst thing is probably long distance running and leg weights together. The way your body feels at the end of the day, you know, you can't, you get home and you just, uh, you just spent. Do you think the break was long enough? Never. <laughs> it's never long enough, is it? We're both getting on in our, in our age, 33 years old. We've got some young kids coming up, probably uh, snapping at our heels. What do you reckon? They reckon take our spot or not a chance? Well, I reckon not a chance. A couple more years, yet. Yeah, I think they're, they're taking it all on board and uh, learning a fair bit from me. Uh, I don't know about you, you haven't been at training, but... Nothing for me, mate. <laughs> How's Wayne Bennett been? He's been back for a week now. He's, he's been rattling a few cages. How are you been feeling? Yeah, yeah, he's, it's good to have him back. Um, there's always a few blow-ups. I think there's a little less on me this year with a few younger boys in the squad, so it's always good to give me a bit of slack. Do you reckon they're going, they sh they're going a bit too hard on the older fellas here? They're getting run into the ground trying to retire us, I reckon. You haven't even started pre-season yet, have you? <laughs> no, I haven't done anything. I just did a run today. Well, it's not unusual for an Aussie footy player to spend some time in the Super League, but uh, you, Michael Dobson, spent an extended period over there and also in the prime of your career. Uh, welcome back to Australia. Yeah, thanks, mate. It's good to be back. Long time over there. What did you learn? Uh, I got a chance to establish myself in the Super League, playing week in, week out, and it, it just gave me a chance to get more knowledge of the game, um, play against quality players week in, week out, and uh, I think I did pretty well over there, and it's, it's good to be back, and hopefully I can get a good crack here. Um, haven't played in the NRL since 2008. Are you concerned that the game might have changed a little bit? Oh, it definitely would have, uh, would have changed, but as I said, I've been playing uh, first grade over there um, for six years, and got a lot more years under my belt, being 27 now, and uh, yeah, it's going to take a little bit of time with the speed of the game, but um, that's what trials are for, and hopefully uh, early on in the season. You established yourself uh, extremely well in that halfback position. Is that where you're hoping to play here in Australia? Oh, it's obviously my preferred uh, position, but if, uh, if Wayne puts me somewhere else, I'll, I'll happily go anywhere, as long as I'm hopefully playing first grade. That, that's, that's the goal, and uh, I know I've got a job in front of me with, um, with Tyrone there and also Jarrett, so um, we'll wait and see what happens. Huge potential this team uh, showed in 2013 and obviously heading into 2014. Uh, how did you end up here? Yeah, well, it came around pretty quick, actually. Uh, I got an offer from Newcastle, and uh, it happened within probably 20 minutes. I said yes, and yeah, I'm excited because uh, the way they finished last year, hopefully I can be a, a part of something special this year. Look, I want to talk about this uh, international quota rules uh, back at uh, Hull um, in 2011, where essentially uh, you were deregistered for one Willie Mason. Um, how do you find yourself now playing with him? Yeah, oh, it's obviously good to be uh, playing with him. I didn't get a chance to play with him there because I got deregistered for him to play when I was injured. And uh, yeah, it was a pretty random uh, situation. But uh, he's definitely a character and he's uh, good to have around the joint. Has he bought you a beer or something and said, uh, mate, thanks for the opportunity? <laughs> no, he hasn't. But uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty of time for that, mate. It's been a little bit of a slow start to the pre-season for you. Uh, tell us about your injury. 
Yeah, I had uh, just a bit of shoulder surgery to uh, tighten up um, a few injuries there and uh, I can't wait to really rip in with the boys once I'm uh, back on fully fit. Mate, good luck in 2014. Thank you. Still to come on NRL pre-season, Knights enforcer Robbie Rocco lets us in on a little secret, the squad's newest training regime. Yeah, we've introduced yoga into this pre-season. Mate, I'd rather lay there and relax for most of it. They're in sync on the footy field, but why can't Jared Mullen and Tyrone Roberts get along off it? It's so weird. It's weird. Are you? I do, I swear I've, I've done it. Where did that come from, honestly? I don't know anything about it. <laughs> Premiers. The Melbourne Storm beaten at home just once this season. But this time of year, you expect them to lift in a big way. Who's going to play the Roosters for a spot in the grand final? Here's Jeremy Smith giving it to Mullen. Quick hands, Gagai goes on to Uate. Uate with one to beat. Uate is in. He bumped Billy Slater away and said, let me score the first try. Cameron Smith heading across field deep. Widdop goes long. Here's Maurice Blair. Melbourne are off and running. They answer Achille Uate through Maurice Blair. Builder to Mullen. Flat. Bostock gives it for Houston. Chris Houston goes over. On half time, Newcastle now 10 4. Comes to Mullen, who measures his kick. It's still a bomb for Slater. Who leaves it behind on the ground, picked up, over goes Matt Hilda. This is the last for Melbourne. From 28 metres out, it comes for Cronk to chip and chase. Cronk is there, he gets it, throws the ball out. A push on from Brubridge to Wonga. Sisa Wonga. That's some of Melbourne's best. They're not dead yet. 15 seconds, what's coming next? Norrie gives it for Smith to go long. On the crop, Proctor into a hole. Infield Slater, he's the man they want with his hands on the ball. There's the siren. Is that the end? It is. Newcastle live to fight another week with Wayne Bennett in charge. Some veterans in the field. They've won it 18 16. Well, the Knights' first trial match is a little bit different to previous years. They'll take on a team of non-elite Indigenous players to kick off the Festival of Indigenous Rugby League. It all takes place on the 8th of February at Hunter Stadium, with the Knights taking on the First Nations Goannas, coached by New South Wales Blues coach Laurie Daly. After the Auckland Nines tournament, Newcastle will clash with the Raiders. That's at Scully Park, Tamworth. And the Knights' opening game of 2014 sees them travel to Cenebet Stadium to take on the Penrith Panthers. Now, we all know how fast Dane Gagai is out on the footy field. Well, in the off-season, he's taken his speed work to new heights, as Lara found out. He steps, he puts on a sprint, he steps and he swerves, and he takes it inside the 30-metre line. Dane, straight back into pre-season, but... You went away on a bit of a trip. Tell us about that. Yeah, I, I went over to the States. Um, we, we landed in Dallas and we, um, me, Robbie Rocker and Alex McKinnon did a bit of training at um, Michael Johnson's Performance Centre. And um, yeah, they, they compared us to a lot of their athletes. We did a bit of testing, a bit of training and um, yeah, we got a lot from it. They, um, they helped us work on our sprinting technique. We got some sprinting coaches and um, yeah, they gave us the uh, elite I guess facilities. What can you bring back to the field here? The professionalism of um, a lot of the athletes I met over there and um, it was just a bit of an eye opener for me so um, yeah I think it's the best thing I could have done because I've come back into this pre-season with a, a lot different attitude and I'm just trying to work every day just to improve myself and just try to become the best player I can be and just to never stop trying to improve. Where do they go? They come right. Mullen, the gag great year last year, your first taste of finals football, what did you learn? Yeah, obviously, um, first taste of finals football, um, a lot of butterflies and nerves, but it makes it a lot easier when you still got those older heads in the group, like um, Willie Mason, Jeremy Smith, um, Bo Scott, Chris Elston, um, and and then having the coach we do and Wayne Bennett, um, it, it, I felt comfortable in the finals, I didn't 
feel out of place and I don't think any of the boys did. Um, yeah, we, we obviously fell one short from last year, but never know what's going to happen this year. So all we can do is just try to keep improving every day and, um, yeah, just work harder. Last year, the Knights were labelled Dad's Army. They go into this season, though, losing over 400 games of experience. Let's take a look at who has moved on. Danny Badiris hangs up the boots, and Neville Costigan has signed with English side Hull KR. Craig Gower also departs after a short stint in Newcastle. The Knights also lose youngsters Kevin Naguama and Peter Matayutai, along with Will Smith. 2014, though, sees the return of local favourite Clint Newton after being released by the Panthers and former Raiders halfback Michael Dobson returns after six years in the Super League. On the paddock, the team certainly looks healthy and raring to go for the new season. But from your perspective, most importantly, how's the team looking off the field? Yeah, really good. I mean, we're working pretty hard. There's not a lot of downtime, uh, particularly for our administration. Although the players get some time off in October, we tend to keep our heads down and review the year and start planning for, for the next year. So, uh, yeah, we're looking forward to the season. How much did that back end of the season help you guys? Because this town really got back behind the, the club. Yeah, I think that was a real highlight for me, particularly leading into that Roosters game um, in the grand final playoff. It was great to see the town come alive and certainly plenty of uh, red and blue down in, in Sydney for, um, you know, for, that, for that big game. So that was nice to see. So there's no doubt when our team's playing well, you know, it brings enormous confidence to our, to our entire region up here. So uh, hopefully we can, um, we can start 2014 the way we finished 2013. You've had a busy off-season with a couple of young players taking them on a, a remarkable journey. Can you tell us a, a bit about that? And uh, first of all, there was an award given out. Yeah, that's right. So we, uh, it's the Kokoda Spirit Award. So we take um, uh, a few of our most promising NYC players um, over to Kokoda. The four young players that come with us were Sione Matayutai, um, Joe Topine, Josh Birch and Lachlan Fitzgibbon, um, who will all feature in our NYC team this year. How long did it take you? What was the climate like? Give us some specifics on what you were up against. Yeah, well, I said, I said to the to the guys um, about two or three days in, I don't think it should be called the Kokoda Trek, you know, it's a climb. We were climbing every day, so you sort of climb up and down. Um, I mean, the, the weather's really humid, but um, the whole history of the track and the story of the track, um, it, was, it was really emotional, rewarding as well, um, you know, physically really demanding. OK, just lastly, the coach, what sense do you get from him? Does he feel like this year the team's far better place? Yeah, I think so. I think you can see, and particularly the, the back end of last year, you can see Wayne's philosophy starting to come through in the way the team's playing. Mm. I think from a roster point of view, we're really happy with the roster we've, we've been able to assemble. Um, we, we've got a nice nice balance of um, experience and youth. And, you know, we just need to try and keep, you know, like most clubs, keep our key guys healthy. But, uh, you know, we're, we're really looking forward to uh, 2014. Tyrone Roberts, straight through, over halfway. Looking for support, got the ball back away. Jared Bunnan is chased from behind. They won't get to him. He scores a great try. Jared Marlin, Tyro and Roberts, the pair of you together, very crucial in the Newcastle Knights' success. We want to test how well the halves pairing at the Newcastle Knights know each other. How well, first of all, before we get started, do you think you know each other? Very well. Yeah. I, think I know him. Sort of grow up with him, so I know I know everything about him. Yeah, I'm not so confident as much as he is, <laughs> but I'll give it a shot. I'll start with you, Tyrone. When is Jared's birthday? Um, I know it's in April. I might take a rough guess, but April 12th. How old is he? 25. <laughs> 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 I know it is. 9th of April, 26. And when's Tyrone's birthday? Uh, June? Yep. June? 14th? June 1st. Oh. <laughs> hey, yeah, it's Robin's birthday. I should have known that. <laughs> June 1st. 20... 22. Yep. Yep. Yeah, see? So. Correct. What is Jared's middle name? John. <laughs> Where did that come from? I'll just change that. Nah, Stephen. Your dad's name. Tyrone. James. No. No. It's John. <laughs> <laughs> What's the dish that Jared can cook? Can you cook Xin Xin Bao? What do you call it? Xin Xin Bao? That's it. Xin Xin Bao. It's a new one. It's a new one they bring it out, I think. No, I can cook a barbecue. You cook a good barbecue. Oh, no. I mean, can Tyrone cook anything? Ah, uh, he wouldn't cook. His missus cooks. No, you don't I cook. cook. It. What do you, you cook? That there. What do you call it? Xin Xin Bao? Yeah. Oh, you I cook. do. I swear I've, I've done it. Okay, if Tyron wasn't playing footy, what would he be doing? 
Oh, God. I don't know. Grass. I said any football, no one would know what I think. He said grass. What does that mean? Greenkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about him. <laughs> what would Jared be if he wasn't playing footy? Torture. <laughs> <laughs> Professional torture. Torture. Um, coach. 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 Can talk. Well, you don't talk, so someone's got to talk. OK, that leads me to a question about on-field behaviour. You say he's not very talkative. Does that mean you do all the talking on the field? Yeah. I do all the talking and he just listens. He's getting better, but he's just shy, shy as a kid. I get the blame if he starts out. <sighs> From who? From my end. Yeah, it ain't scary. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty scary. You can't question him. If you do something wrong and it wasn't your fault, you say it's your fault. No one argues. Oh, Jez argues. All the bikes have had Darbs argues. <laughs> all, the, all the Wayne's bikes argue, but... Uh, you two aren't Wayne's blokes. I've set him up for a couple of tries. I think he's turned the favour, oh. I reckon. Oh, yeah. Of course you have. <laughs> Doing a lot of talking now. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Save it for the field, mate. <laughs> 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 OK, well done. Good luck this year, boys. <laughs> The Newcastle Knights were the sleeping giants of the 2013 season, surprising many making it to the grand final qualifier. They rode a wave of top form inspired by some individual brilliance, in particular 22-year-old back rower Robbie Rocco, one of only two Novocastrians to play every game. Gibley then trying to bring them in, Rocco will score! Rocco scores for Newcastle. Following this standout year, the young knight is back for another gruelling pre-season. But when we sat down with him, he quickly explained how different the club's approach is this time around. Yeah, we've introduced Yoga into this pre-season. Um, uh, I know Danny Badira still goes. He ke still keeps his rig in good nick, so I've been going with him a fair bit, and then um, now it's a part of our training schedule, so... I've done a little bit of research. What's your favourite move? I've got it here, but I, I just wa I want you to tell me. Um, my favourite move, I don't have a favourite move. Would you like me to tell you No, your no, move? no, you don't, because <laughs> my favourite one's laying there on my back with my <laughs> eyes closed. The Twisted Crescent Lunge. Oh, yeah, yep. Can yep. you show us? <laughs> twisted Crescent Lunge, that one? The, I don't know, you're telling <laughs> me, is that it? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that one, but, um, oh, mate, I'd rather lay there and relax for most of it. Rocco, a local boy born and bred in Maitland, always had aspirations of playing for his beloved Knights, but to fulfil his childhood dream, he would have to say goodbye. The next stage of his journey would take him away from New South Wales and lead him to a man that's left a lasting impression on this talented forward. I got offered to go down and play under-20s with Melbourne. Um, that was under Brad Arthur, who's a current coach at Eels now, and, you know, he was... A, he was probably my most influential coach at them. You know, he, he changed the way I played and the way I approached training and games and, and made me a better player. And, and it's probably a big reason why I'm playing now is the time I spent down there under him and obviously under Craig. Rocco made the trip back to Newcastle, signing with the Knights in 2012, a year that coincided with the return of club legend Danny Badiris, giving the gun local a unique opportunity to play alongside his childhood idol. Yeah, like I still remember supporting the Knights growing up and, you know, watching Badiris play. You just, you just wouldn't think you'd play with him. You know, it's not something that, that entered my mind at all. I just, you know, it was something that I did growing up here. We, me and Dad would come to the games, but I've learnt so much from players past and present. Um, even Matt Gids and Chief, who, who hang around the club a lot. I, I love talking to them. It's so good for me and, and for, my, for my playing career. Robbie's success has stemmed from a deep-rooted family support network, including his biggest fan, his mum. She gets so excited and so ecstatic over every little training session or a bit of media that gets thrown up. So, you know, that's, that she's incredibly proud. But you know, the rest of the family, um, yeah, it's so good to be playing NRL in a town where we're from and where they're around because you know they get to watch every game and, and support your games. And I mean. You know, it makes it so much worthwhile when you finish a game and you know you played well and your family was there. It's just, you know, it's that extra bit. Robbie's family life and playing career crossed paths early last season with his sister Becky dating Titans captain Greg Bird. A trip to the Gold Coast in round seven took on a very different complexion. You know, I was, I was more worried about performing well than getting one back on someone who dates my sister, but... Um, you you know, don't try we... and line him up. 
Oh, he tried to line me up a few times, <laughs> and I just, yeah, it was all right. It was, it, was, it was a good bit of fun. I like the competition, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that'll be something that's going to brew it with, between us for the next few years while he's playing and I'm playing, so I'm looking forward to it. But, you know, I think, I think he hasn't beaten me yet. Now, with a full NRL season under his belt, Rocco's attention has turned to how he can leave his own unique mark on this passionate rugby league club. I just want to experience it more and more, and I think that's where that, um, you know, where I want to leave my mark and what what not will come from. But you know, still at this time, I still feel like I need to prove myself as an NRL player and and to the to the older guys that I'm actually training with at the moment. So I think that's more of my goal and aspirations at the moment. He's had a history of trouble and tonight Willie Mason is back in the headlines. The Newcastle Knights player was caught drink driving on his way to training this morning. A repentant Willie Mason asking for his fans forgiveness. No one's above the law and I'm um, obviously broke it and I've got to deal with the consequences. Charged with mid-range drink driving after too many beers on Australia Day. Last drink was at 11.30, you know, so I had about seven hours sleep so I thought I was, I was fine. The Knights forward was out drinking in Newcastle. His Instagram account showed him celebrating with a beer and the Australian flag. But shortly after 7 o'clock this morning on his way to training, he was pulled over by police on this street in Mayfield, registering a blood alcohol level of 0 0.09. Yeah, I was a bit shocked. But, um, yeah, sort of reality hit straight away. You know, they took me in and... Um, you know, arrested me. It's the latest chapter in a controversial playing history. Fined for a boozy night out during a 2004 Origin camp. Voted the league's most hated player by fans in 2007. And in 2008, he was caught urinating in public in Port Macquarie. His sign up to the Newcastle Knights was seen by many as a lifeline for the troubled star. And this latest incident couldn't come at a worse time for the club. Less than a month after prop Russell Packer was jailed for two years for assaulting a man outside a Sydney bar. Now their star forward will also go before the courts. Well hopefully this doesn't reflect on the last couple of years that I've you know um, played and my profile and image and all that kind of stuff. And Laura Tunstall is at NRL headquarters tonight. Laura what's the league's official response? Yeah, well, Pete, there's no word yet as to whether Mason will be facing any kind of disciplinary action, either from his own club or from the NRL over this. The NRL says its integrity unit is aware of what has happened and is working closely with the Newcastle Knights. Mason told us today that he does intend to plead guilty to the charge. He's due to appear in Newcastle local court on the 20th of February, and he says before that date, he will be undertaking an alcohol awareness court course. Certainly there wasn't a lot of sympathy though from other NRL fans today, many taking to social media to express their disappointment at Willie Mason's latest episode of bad behaviour. OK, Laura, thank you for that. Newcastle Knights star Willie Mason has apologised to fans after being charged with drink driving. He was pulled over for a random breath test this morning on his way to training. He registered a reading of 0.09. Mason was charged with a mid-range offence and will face court in three weeks. He says he's disappointed to have let down coach Wayne Bennett, the club and fans. The Newcastle Knights Club has had another unwanted incident in the lead up to 2014 season. Forward Willie Mason has failed a random breath test this morning. He was pulled over on his way to training and allegedly blew 0 .09. He was charged with low range drink driving and will face Newcastle local court on February 20. Will, plenty of social media reaction to this one I'd imagine, including from Willie. Yes, the big man has apologised and here is his tweet. Uh, I've taken the spelling mistakes out for everybody. Uh, Mace21, just want to say sorry to everyone. I take full responsibility. It was bad judgement. I thought I was fine to drive. Obviously not. Sorry again. So it seems as though he's had a big night and thought he was alright in the morning, but clearly not. But the fact is that, you know, he was going to training, so he probably should have laid off the sauce. I don't know. Mm. Anyway. Poor judgement, sugar? Or oh. an unwanted trend? Oh, I think it's a little bit of both, actually. And I think for the NRL and the club, so much money involved in this great game of ours, 
hours. I think it's time now, uh, these early training sessions, and I don't know why every player wouldn't have one of those uh, do-it-yourself breathalysers, keep it in the car, uh, just to get on the front foot there. So, look, it was bad judgment. Off to a training session. I wonder what Wayne Bennett thinks about that the night before a big season. So, uh, bad judgment for sure, but um, we need to be doing something a bit more than that. Maguire was in the sights of the Broncos, while Wayne Bennett has again been linked to a return to Brisbane next year. The Knights coach isn't rushing to replace sack prop Russell Packer. I want a quality player to come to the club. I don't want some journeyman. OK, so um, we will. I'm confident enough with what I've got there. Newcastle dominated their match against the Goannas, a team made up of amateur Indigenous players and former NRL stars. They control the ball pretty good, pretty disciplined and put some nice football on. In Newcastle, the First Nations Goannas stood up to the Knights. The team of players from Indigenous communities showed plenty of talent but couldn't match the NRL professionals in a 40-point defeat. He can't get him this time. We'll all be back at Suncorp next year and we'll be on with all the stars. So um, I thought it was great for these young men here today to, to have this opportunity. The North Queensland Cowboys have taken out the inaugural NRL Nines tournament, beating the Broncos 16-7 in the grand final. Rugby League reporter Aaron Mullen joins us live from Auckland. Aaron, the Cowboys are a whole lot richer tonight. Yeah, that's right, Kenny. Over $300,000 richer and their first major title as well. Almost 90,000 people came here to Eden Park over this weekend to watch this tournament. They loved absolutely every second of it with people hailing this tournament an absolute success. The big hits and even bigger names again on show after a forgettable off-season. Willie Mason jagged a rare try. I haven't scored. I didn't score one all last year. New Bronco Ben Barber was chased down by a flying Chris Sando. When the quarterfinals began, so did the real drama. Jared Mullen did his hamstring. Good evening. The Cowboys are the inaugural Auckland Nines champions after beating the Broncos 16 points to 7 in the final of what was an injury plague tournament. It's North Queensland's first trophy, while the Sharks were the best of the Sydney teams, reaching the final four. Dressed to the nines for the nines, the Sharks, even without Paul Gallen and Todd Carney, stormed into the playoffs. Nathan Gardner, a ball back on the inside, a little bit of Sharks magic. The Knights steamrolled the Tigers on their way to the quarters. Out of my way, he says. Yesterday's hero, Brad Fittler, was a spectator as the Roosters fell to the Bulldogs, both out of the running, though. Josh Dugan set up the Dragons' win over the Storm, but Dylan Farrell won't remember much of it. Newcastle's Jared Mullen carved up the Broncos in their quarterfinal until this. Oh no! Mullen has done a hamstring! Sniper! There's a sniper at Eden Park! Oh. Shot him! The Broncos through to the semis. Sonny Bill Williams and the majority of the Roosters' grand final stars had a low-key tune-up for the World Club Challenge, skipping the nines to play a trial at Wyong last night. A rusty Sonny Bill still caused plenty of problems for Newcastle's reserve graders in a special appearance at Morrie Breen Oval. It was a rare treat to have them out, all in, uh, all in the one hit, but you know, we're thankful they all got through unscathed and, and played quite well. Jared Weary Hargreaves is ready for his battle with Wigan on Saturday, scoring a try in the Roosters' 32-4 win. Todd Carney and Jared Mullen will both carry torn hamstrings towards round one. You don't go there to, to tear the hammy, I suppose, but uh, it was a good atmosphere over there and they really put on a good show. So. It's the greatest fear as coaches in the, in the pre-season, but I don't think there's any more there than would have been with the other the 16 teams playing somewhere else across the country. Surprisingly, league's most seasoned players survived unscathed. Oh, he's got a sore uh, headgear. That's about it. Yvonne Sampson, Nine News. Coaches and players say the Auckland Nines must stay. Don't create a fuss over a bloody injury over a new tournament because if it happens today or round one, it's no different. David Williams should know tomorrow if he'll play again this season. At the moment, it's just a grade one abrasion. Just a little scratch on the knee, I think. It's amusing for the Wolfman, not Lachlan Coote. We did bring it, put a smile on the face for something, so I guess it was worth something going over there. Out for six months, his knee was the worst of 16 injuries over the weekend. That's our greatest fear as coaches in the, in the pre-season, but I don't think there's any more there than would have been with the other the 16 teams playing somewhere else across the country. It's part of the game. As soon as you sign that contract, if you want to play nines, you play nines, you get injured, you get injured, so it's part of the deal. Matt Carmichael, 7 News. <laughs>
Plus, a blow for the Knights ahead of the NRL season. The sport now with uh, Matty Burke and Jared Mullen could miss the first four months of the season. Yeah, not a great start to the year, is it, uh, Hugh? Uh, scans show the Newcastle Knights 5'8 has torn his hamstring off the bone. It's a devastating result for Mullen, who was in career-best form last season. The former New South Wales Origin player suffered the injury during the Auckland Nines. Not so lucky for the Knights playmaker, Jared Mullen, who is facing up to four months on the sideline after tearing his hamstring. Sport now with Jim Wilson and Jim the Nines claims another casualty. Mark, it's a major blow for a Newcastle star that could also impact on the Blues for Origin, but there's good news for Manly. We begin with breaking news at Penrith with former Dragon and star recruit Jamie Soward suffering what appears to be an ankle injury. Soward left the club after training today in a moon boot and immediately headed for scans. Now the fallout from the Auckland Nines continues with Manly's David Williams cleared of serious injury today but Newcastle star Jared Mullen, he could be sidelined for up to four months. Scans indicate Mullen tore his hamstring off the bone against the Broncos. He'll see a surgeon on Monday who'll confirm the extent of the damage. That's pretty shattering actually, but um, mate, I'll just have to you know, get in the rehab and get back on the park as soon as possible. And Kurt Gidley made a promising return from a foot injury in the Knights 34-14 win over the Raiders in Tamworth. Juros in 7 News. A brand new segment this year. Yes, we have, and it's all yours, Erin. It's <laughs> something that uh, I'm happy. I've got something that I want to pass on to you. We'll find I out what that you is. Might slice. But we are calling it the Molan Files. <laughs> What's it all about? YouTube, Twittering? There's a, yeah, there's a few different parts of it. So it's basically we've got the player picks, which is the player's favourite YouTube videos. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of very funny stuff in there. We've got social media, and anyone that oh. follows me on Instagram or any social media knows that I absolutely love it, sometimes too much. Twitter. Which you do tell me. Twitter. I do. You've just joined Twitter yeah, as well. Yeah, I joined it yesterday. Which is very exciting. So follow control, both. So it's good, yeah. Yeah, yeah, loving it. Um, so we're going to look at players' tweets, fans' tweets, lots of different funny things on Instagram, Facebook, the whole shebang. Also, lookalikes, which Slats has passed over my way, a fan favourite. So we've got lots of lookalikes as well. But it's all yours. as you would say, Bo, we've also got an opener. So roll the tape, Ginjal. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, you don't, you don't say Ginjul. Oh, what are you doing? Say, you might do a roll the tape, Did you mean to say that? And Ginj, can I just say, that was on my script, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, wasn't, that wasn't you know, our living. It's that just was Ginge. on the script. Just, just Ginj. Not, not roll Ginjul. the tape, Ginj. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've already done it, so you yeah, just... Yeah, it's too late. Okay, now in player picks, the players have given us their requests for the best YouTube and online clips to show you. Now, this week, our player pick comes from the Knights, from Adam Cuthbertson. This one is very funny. Adam, over to you. Uh, best cry ever. Uh, it's just about some guy that cries funny. <laughs> All right, a second break's coming up, and here we go. Second instalment of the player probe. Primary school, I've got cups and spoons a lot because cups and spoons to primary school kids sounds like cups and spoons. The Panthers unleashed a physical mauling on Newcastle to open their NRL 2014 account. The Knights lost a number of key players to either injury or concussion as Penrith ran away with the contest, winning 30 points to eight. Old faces at a new club, Darius Boyd in trouble, Dave Simmons in agony, while Knights fans were probably wishing Danny Badira still wore the number nine. But it was Newcastle crossing first in fine style. Running over the ball, Bo Scott will take some stopping. Kurt Gidley's day finished early after being concussed. Gidley's head is hit. It was clear that this was round one, the skills suffering in 28 degree heat, but the Panthers brought their fans to their feet just prior to half time in unlikely fashion. Who loses it forward, back to Sound. Sound goes to Elijah Taylor, and persistence pays off. Penrith with just five wins from 20 games against the Knights at Sporting Bet Stadium, but they surged to the lead on the back of a rampaging Josh Mansour. Josh Mansour! And guess who, moments later. Josh Mansour again! The winger turned acrobat Penrith up 18 to 8. And it was a Pink Panther party when Dean Farre chipped, chased and dished off with class. Here comes a try for Docker. Get out of my way, he says. The Panthers moving aside Newcastle to claim a solid round one victory. Rob Canning, 9 News. 
Good evening. The Panthers have shown no mercy against an injury-ravaged Newcastle at Penrith this afternoon. Reduced to 14 men, the Knights were hammered 30 points to 8 after leading by 2 at half-time. So what is Jamal Penrith's big side signings side were in demand. A sideline former Titan, a former Dragon and a former Bronco back where it all began. Peter Wallace is back in Penrith. But celebrations were brief. The try disallowed for a cheeky jersey grab by Lewis Brown on Kurt Gidley. After fending off the Panthers, the Knights hit back. Dobson flat, running over the ball. Bo Scott will take some stopping. Darius Boyd was a first-half casualty, straining his hamstring. Then Gidley was sent for a concussion test after copping a double blow in this tackle. He failed the test. The Knights were hard to crack, so Jamie Soward went to the air. For Uate, who loses it forward, back to Soward. Soward goes to Elijah Taylor, and persistence pays off. Down 8-6 at the break, the Panthers look to their one-man wrecking machine to grab the lead. A test for the hamstring here. Running through or running around, the Penrith Flyer had a field day. Just Mansour again! The home side putting on a show against a depleted Knights team. Here comes a try for Docker. Get out of my way, he says. Newcastle down to 14 men after Tyrone Roberts was floored. The Knights beaten and badly bruised by a ruthless Panthers outfit. Now McKinnon! Stopped by Nigel! Jerosin, 7 News. Same scenario for Knights, Kurt Gidley, who wasn't allowed to come back on yesterday after the Panthers. I know the boys spoke about that. Tyrone Roberts as well will be monitored. Their teammate Darius Boyd left the field after hurting his hamstring. Club will know more this week. The Knights have had a horror start to the year with injury. Probably no other club more affected than them. They obviously lost Jared Mullen in the preseason as well. And for their coach, Wayne Bennett, as experienced as he is, he is at a loss as what to do. Yeah, down to two interchange and you got guys out of position and cost us two tries, but it wasn't their fault, it's just that you know, they're not used to playing there and and um, that became the 18 8 lead there, the bit of momentum they wanted. And after that, we were brave, stayed at it, but it just wasn't running for us. Wayne, well, are you happy after the Gagai's performance that you'll probably keep him at fullback next week if Darius doesn't? Oh, it's a tough call at the moment, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, you know, we've got to find a centre, if we put him in fullback, we've got to find a centre. And, we to find something else and I might have to find another hooker and you know, it's um, too early if I'm going to call those. Well Chris, fair to say that's probably the game from hell. You lose by 22 and you're 1-7 and 9 in the sheds busted. Yeah, that's right. We had um, plenty of changes out there and we weren't controlling the ball well and um, the Panthers, Panthers just did that better than us and put some points on. So yeah, it was a tough day at the office. Rule changes, speeding up. How did you feel it? Yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty quick out there, you know. Uh, they kicked the 40 20 and we went to the scrum and they said, no, nah, it's a tap and sort of caught, caught me off guard. But uh, has, uh, the rule change they had made it a lot quicker and you know, I suppose it's more entertaining for the fans, tougher on the body, but um, you know, we'll adapt to it. And Willie Mason banned from driving after an all day bender. Rugby league star Willie Mason might be back on the field for the Newcastle Knights, but he'll be off our roads for some time yet. Today he was sentenced over the drink driving charge that followed an 11-hour bender. Natasha Squarey was there. The day didn't start well for Willie Mason, arriving an hour late to court. Anything you want to say, Willie? Any apologies? To learn his punishment for getting so drunk on Australia Day, he was still almost twice the limit when he was pulled over the next morning on his way to work. His barrister told the court he should have made wiser decisions. The magistrate banned him from driving for six months, starting from the day he was picked up, which means he'll be back on the road in three months. Um, I respect the, the court's judgment and I accept um, everything they've that I've, uh, that I've gotten there, so, um, yep, just get on with life now. He was also fined $900. The magistrate said Mason's public profile is a double-edged sword, but he still has a responsibility to show young people how to behave. He urged the football star to use this experience as a lesson to those who look up to him. I think it's um, opened every, everybody's eyes up that, um, you know, the next day is important and I'll be doing my best you know, for the next um, you know, year or two to educate all these young kids. Today, the Newcastle Knights stood by its star, saying the club will continue to review the matter internally. The club takes this matter very seriously and will continue to educate our players in acting responsibly.
Expecting a driving ban, Mason has already moved in with teammate Jared Mullen to make catching a lift to training a little easier. Natasha Squarey, 10 Eyewitness News. NRL star Willie Mason has been fined at $900 and banned from driving for six months after pleading guilty to drink driving. The Newcastle Knights Ford was pulled over for a random breath test on his way to training at 7 o'clock the morning after an Australia Day drinking session. You know, the next day is important and I'll be doing my best, you know, for the next um, you know, year or two to educate all these young kids and, um, and, and keep doing the work that I've been doing um, off, off, off the footy field anyway, so you thank you. Like the 33-year-old says he respects the court's decision. Newcastle Knights star Willie Mason has been banned from driving for six months and fined $900 for drink driving following an Australia Day bender with his mates. The 33-year-old was pulled over on his way to training the next morning and still blew 0 .09, nearly twice the legal limit. I think it's um, opened every, everybody's eyes up that um, you know the next day is important and I'll be doing my best you know, for the next um, you know, year or two to educate all these young kids. Mason may also face a club sanction. Last night, the Anthony Milford-inspired Raiders down the night. Newcastle say they're not entirely to blame for the loss. We seem to get penalised a fair bit last night, so and a few crucial, crucial errors. You know, from you can't blame refs, can you? you get in trouble. Danny Widler, Nine News. Now, they're not the only club that would appear to be in financial strife. A deadline is looming for the Nathan Tinkler-owned Hunter Sports Group to roll over a $10 million bank guarantee, which was part of the buyout deal executed back in 2011. Much publicised has been the financial woes of the one-time billionaire, but Knights officials are confident the guarantee will be in place by the due date, the 31st of this month. Now, I had a chat with the Knights official today who informed me that this is effectively a story that has been cut and paste from last year. Yeah. Every time this bank guarantee rolls around, the Knights Members Club, who have been uh, given the duty mm. of uh, running an audit across the responsibilities, that yeah, came yeah. as part of this conditional buyout mm. takes place. Now, Look, there's a slight difference though. Y yeah. The slight difference is, is that bank guarantee that Nathan Tinkler, that you say turn, pops up every year, that Nathan Tinkler is expected to provide for the, uh, for the football club so they can run their operating costs, is supposed to be paid by January 31st. This year, okay, he asked for a two month extension because he didn't have the cash there, you know, or he, he had the cash there, but he needed it to use in other areas to bring some money into the company. So he's asked for a two month extension, which gives him now to March 31st. On top of that, in the past 12 months, he has sold his, well, his company, Aston Resources, has gone into receivership. He sold his share in Whitehaven Coal for $300 million. Two years ago, in 2012, he was worth estimated $915 million, one of Australia's richest men. Last year, the Business Review Weekly brought out their rich list, top 200, and he didn't make the cut. He's dropped a few places. He's dropped saying. a few places. So people want to know, is the money there? And the other thing, and this is the, the warning bell that's gone off, he's bad at paying his debts. Yeah, well, here's the other thing that came up as part of my discussion today, is that on the way in, Nathan T Tinkler had to pay out the debts of the Knights Football Club. Yeah. So I think that was somewhere in the vicinity of seven or eight million dollars. Yep. So they're gone. Yep. They're debt free. Yep. As owner of that club, he had to guarantee to the tune of ten million dollars each year revenue yep. for the football club. Yep. The bank guarantee in place, if Nathan Tinkler and the Hunter Sports Group happens to fall over, falls into the bank account of the Knights Football Club. But he, so hasn't, he hasn't provided that ten million yet that it bank. comes from the bank. It, well, but it's, it's, it's currently in place. So that, that's, if, if, they fall, if he falls over, if the Hunter Sports Group falls no, over... they're right, waiting for it to be in place. He asked for an extension to give that money. He hasn't provided that money yet. I think you'll find that the bank guarantee hasn't gone anywhere. It needs, it's, it's about getting another 12-month extension on the guarantee. So as right. I understand it, right. and it's explained to me, mm -hmm. if Nathan Tinkler and the Knights are no longer, the Knights will go into the future debt-free with $10 million in the bank. That, and that's, that's good. Uh, can I just put a fly in your ointment there? Yeah. The fly in the ointment is that the Knights do not run at, as a, run at a profit. So 
while there's $10 million sitting in their bank account, they are able to go and continue being a, a, an operating football club. But that $10 million will slowly erode year after year to the tune of several million dollars each year. So it doesn't buy them a lot. It, it provides them an initial period of grace. But beyond that, the club in that time has to find a way to become self-sufficient. Fair to say, And that's though, always been the Knights' on. problem for, since 1988. Yeah, I accept that. But it's fair to say that they're going to be in a better position after Nathan Tinkler than they were before Nathan of Tinkler. Of course they will. But, but they're not going to be in a safe position. Meanwhile, the Knights insist it's business as usual. Despite growing concerns, Nathan Tinkler is struggling to bankroll the club. If people read papers and that, it's what they do on their own time. But once we're here at the, uh, the trainer facilities, we uh, get on with the job at hand. Ryan Phelan, Seven News. Don't forget this afternoon, our television game will see Manly play host to the Parramatta Eels. That will be from four o'clock out at Brookvale Oval. But time now to go to Tim Gilbert and his roasters. Thank you, Pete. Yeah, plenty to talk about today. And welcoming uh, James Hooper from The Telegraph. Hoops, how are you, buddy? Always enjoy seeing you Sunday morning, Gilby. <laughs> Big sports... <laughs> Thank you, even in the afternoon. Now. Big sports breakfast, of course, Terry Good. Kennedy. No Thank need you. to touch me, mate. Nice to be here. <laughs> no desire there. Brett Finch, you can touch me brother? if you like, Tim. It's been a tough couple of weeks. <laughs> it's been a rough Big trot. Stuff. All right. OK. <laughs> Good segue. Rough trot. Newcastle <laughs> Knights. What's going on? We saw your piece this morning. The $1 Knights. Look, it's tough times. I hope this story's wrong. I hope Nathan Tinkler does somehow find $10.5 million as a new bank guarantee. But if he doesn't by Tuesday, then the Newcastle members are going to start the process of drawing on the existing $10.5 million cheque. And we could see them buy the club back for a dollar in the course of a week. You've got good mates up there. Willie Mason, you've been a part of a club that struggle. What's it like? Yeah, it's always in the back of your mind. It's, it's never something you worry too much about because you, you always think with the NRL, you know, your, your payment and whatnot would be taken care of. But, yeah, I think with Wayne Bennett there, you couldn't have a better coach in charge at the moment in terms from a player's point of view to just focus on, on the task at hand. Nothing will derail a club like lack of payment or late payment to the player group. That, that is the big thing that can totally derail the club, as if they're not struggling enough in Newcastle. Uh, God bless Robbie Chu. He was the man who put the deal initially. He was the man who would not sign over that club to Nathan Tinkler, private ownership. Everyone said private ownership the way forward, unless they got that bank guarantee. He got hammered for it too. He got yeah. pilloried for yeah. it, mate. They wanted to lynch him up there, right? So he, he got that deal done. But $10 million sounds like a lot of money. I'm telling you, a footy club will burn through that like that. What they need, and the good thing about Nathan Tinkler was the guarantee was there, but the funding was there, as you guys know, to let Newcastle get up with the modern age and get physios in place and modern technology and healthcare in place up there. No question he's done a lot of great things. He has. He, he has tried yeah. to do, implement a lot of magnificent things for the Knights. Their facilities are now state-of-the-art yeah. and their playing roster and their coach is obviously in a terrific position compared to where they were. However, we just need to get to a point where this guarantee is in place. Well, stay with us. Just ahead, we've got more on tonight's big stories. And in sport, a terrifying reminder of the dangers of rugby league. We'll update you on Alex McKinnon's condition after his sickening neck injury. To sport now with Mr Burke and Matt, we have some new details on the health of that young Newcastle Knights player, Alex McKinnon. Yeah, that's right, Andrew. Good evening. We understand doctors have placed McKinnon into an induced coma in a bid to reduce swelling around his fractured neck. There's obvious concerns about McKinnon's football career and, more importantly, his long-term health. Storm player Jordan McLean has been stood down and referred straight to the NRL judiciary. Liam Cox reports. A young man in his prime. Alex McKinnon's injury is sickening. Oh, he just ducked his head in. It didn't look good, obviously, with his head hitting the ground first. Concern plastered on the faces of players from both teams as McKinnon was stretched from the field and taken to hospital. The first question everybody was they came in the room at the full, full time was about Alex, wasn't about anything else. The 22 year old fracturing his C4 and C5. Dr. Peter Larkins explains the injury. So, look, that's about halfway down your spine. It's the real critical point where a lot of the action is. So, it's quite a nasty injury. McKinnon's long term health is the main concern. We know he's had a fractured neck, so straight away that means he won't play rugby for the rest of this season. Um, the real question going forward is what degree of spinal damage he will have. We've got all sorts of potentially bad outcomes from that and of course that affects not sport but day-to-day -day function. The entire NRL community is rallying behind Alex McKinnon 
The game's boss, Dave Smith, says the NRL will do everything it can to support Alex and his family. It's uh, very sad and hopefully uh, Alex has a speedy recovery. Thoughts from the boys here to him and his family. Yeah, my, my heart just went out to him. It, it, uh, it just looked horrible the way it turned out. And, and it shows that, you know, one tackle, one run, uh, you know, one jump, uh, those types of things can, can, can end and, and ruin your career. Cruelly, McKinnon was just days away from signing a contract extension with Newcastle. Liam Cox, 10 Eyewitness News. A young Newcastle Knight is in hospital this evening, unsure if he'll ever play rugby league again. Alex McKinnon broke his neck against the Melbourne Storm. Ken joins me now. Ken, it's every footballer's worst nightmare. Good evening. Oh, Pete, it's a, it's a terrible story. Our thoughts are with him tonight as the NRL took the unusual step of deferring a hearing into the incident out of respect to the injured player. Melbourne's Jordan McLean has already been stood down for one match but may face a longer stint on the sideline when the judiciary hears the case. A gravely worried Wayne Bennett arrived home this afternoon without one of his boys. Yeah, I was at the hospital this morning when his parents arrived. He's getting the best care now and we've got him in the best place we can and getting him all the support we possibly can. So after that, you know, we just hope for the best for him. Alex McKinnon fractured his C4 and C5 vertebra in a sickening tackle gone wrong. Now McKinnon going into the turf head first. Oh, he just ducked his head in. Doctors confirmed McKinnon's spinal cord was not severed, but the incident too frightening for the players to watch. Oh, mate, I, I walked away last night and, uh, when it all happened because you hate to see people in that situation, you know, and you don't want to go over and have a look and stuff like that. It's a scary thought. Bennett spent a sleepless night in Melbourne and for once the master coach doesn't have the answer. Most of them fix up, we, we're just not sure how we can fix this one where it'll all finish so um, yeah coaching has many twists and turns to it and um, just one of the one of the things that's not in the coaching manual. As McKinnon's career hangs in the balance, criticism turned to the Storm skipper Cameron Smith, who argued with the referee as the young knight was being stretched off. We, we, can't, we can't help when he ducks his head to the ground. It's unfortunate, and I don't want to see that happen any time in, in, in our game. But if he doesn't duck his head, that doesn't happen. Oh, yeah, this kid's up there in, a, in the hospital at the moment with a broken neck, and you just keep rattling on about this question like this. We can't answer it anymore. It's, it's up to the match review committee to sort that out. McKinnon has been together with Bennett since 2009 at the Dragons. I have, um, yeah, so if you ask me was he one of my favourites, I'd probably say he was. Yvonne Sampson, Nine News. Just ahead on 10, we've got more on tonight's big stories. Then in sport, Alex McKinnon's heartbroken family breaks its silence. Let's go to sport now with Matt Burke. And uh, Matt, Alex McKinnon's family has spoken for the first time since he broke his neck. Yeah, yes, they have, Hugh, indeed. Late this afternoon, the McKinnon family thanked everyone for their support. In a statement, they confirmed Alex remains in a critical but stable condition in a Melbourne hospital. The rugby league community is still coming to terms with the shocking injury. Obviously our thoughts are with Alex and his family uh, and our focus is very much on, on his welfare. You know, say a few prayers and fingers crossed and, and hopefully he'll, uh, he'll be able to make a full recovery. The family is still unsure of what the 22-year-old's future may hold. The rugby league community is rallying behind Newcastle Knights player Alex McKinnon after doctors confirmed he has suffered a devastating spinal injury. He remains in a critical condition with only limited movement in one arm and is now facing a very long road to recovery. Tipped as a future Origin player and captain of the Knights, Alex McKinnon is now in an induced coma after surgery on his broken vertebrae sustained in this tackle by the Storm's Jordan McLean. Our number one priority just now is with, with Alex and his family. Blues coach Laurie Daly mentored McKinnon in a camp for emerging players. We're just hoping that Alex can make a full recovery. Um, obviously, you know, it was an accident. The 22-year-old faces the prospect of further surgery on his C4 and C5 vertebrae. Doctors say it may take two years to recover. One player who did make a comeback was Ben Ross, who broke his neck in 2009. It took me over two years to come back and that's probably one of the things I would tell him, is not to rush his health. Uh, health is first. 
Knights fan Stuart Jones knows how challenging the rehabilitation process is. He broke two vertebrae in a cycling accident in January. He's made remarkable progress in the ride facility where McKinnon may end up. With great support, good mental attitude, just because you got a spinal injury doesn't mean give up on life. Jordan McLean has been stood down from the Storm's next game against the Bulldogs as he waits to have his case heard at the NRL judiciary. He posted on Facebook, best wishes to Alex McKinnon. I genuinely hope you're all right and have a safe recovery. McLean is receiving counselling from his club. Matthew Snelson, 7 News. It's been a mixed few days across the NRL with everything from great to heartbreaking making the headlines and you can be sure we're going to get through it all on tonight's edition of NRL 360. Rugby League is rocked. We address the tragic injury suffered by Alex McKinnon on Monday night in Melbourne. Good evening and welcome to NRL 360 in a week when a very sombre mood hangs over Rugby League. After Newcastle Knights forward Alex McKinnon suffered what's been described as a devastating spinal injury on Monday night in Melbourne. At the moment, uh, McKinnon is in an induced coma in a Melbourne hospital with his family at his bedside. Uh, the full extent of Alex's injury is now pretty clear with the medical advice saying that his recovery and rehabilitation could take up to two years. Now, the McKinnon family have released a statement today which reads in part, we wish to thank the public and the media for the tremendous support and words of concern we have already received for our son and partner Alex. He remains in a critical but stable condition at the Alfred Hospital and is receiving the very best care. We ask that our family's privacy is respected so that we can focus solely on his recovery. That comes from Kate and Scott McKinnon, Alex's parents and his partner Tegan Power. Uh, this is a, a very terrible, unfortunate incident PK, can you give us any details exactly uh, around the injury itself? Well, we know Ben, he, uh, he had a fracture in the C4 and C5 vertebrae. Uh, fairly early Tuesday, uh, Monday night, Tuesday morning, he was operated on. They took a disc, the disc between the C4 and C5 out. They took some bone, grafted some bone from his hip in the, uh, the, the, in the vertebrae. Um, when he went down injured, he was having trouble breathing. My understanding is that the, the C4 and the C5 also uh, affect your diaphragm. So he's having some problems there. Yeah, he was obviously in a very distressed state. So he, after the operation, they've uh, put him in a, an induced coma. Uh, that's twofold. That's one to stop the movement um, while the bone knits itself. And secondly, because he's having trouble breathing, he's got a ventilator which is obviously very uncomfortable. So the fact that he is uh, in a coma means that he's not suffering that discomfort. Yeah, um, you, you wrote a great article today about Alex, but it would seem to me from what you've written that he's not just your average footballer. Yeah, look, it was an interesting one. Obviously, the Knights closed down after this, and I don't know Alex McKinnon, and I don't know much about him at all. And the, the Knights, under instructions from uh, the coach, were unwilling to talk and I didn't want to press anyone on that so I, I had a sort of a bit of a hunt around about him and I looked at his Twitter site I'm not much of a Twitter person but it was very interesting finding that Twitter site and normally when you find these things they're very superficial Twitter but you know um, but what we found there was a, a real treasure trove I thought uh, into his character uh, rather than his uh, daily events and all the rest of it, he had things on there, for example, he had um, a, a message there about uh, kids with special needs and, and how they're people too, and that's, you know, show some heart uh, was his phrase, and, uh, and um, look after them. And there's another thing there about a, a pair of uh, twin babies that were in hospital, and um, it was just a little story about those two twin babies who... When one of them was sick, they put them in separate incubators and a nurse went against instructions and put them together. And the, the stronger of the twin babies in their first week of life put the arm over the other baby and the, the second baby, who they thought wouldn't make it through the week, uh, the heart rate levelled out, their blood pressure came down 
and the, the baby was on the way to recovery. And I, I just thought that was a bit of a, a metaphor for this young kid in hospital now. Uh, the one thing I'll say about him is, and it's very evident when you look at his Twitter page and, and from people who do know him and spoken about him, the one thing players want most from a teammate is someone that gives and keeps on giving. That's, that's the quality they, they value above everything. And when this poor kid went down on Monday night, He'd broken his neck, immediately said he had problems breathing on the field and couldn't feel his legs. When they were putting him on the gurney to take him off, he was apologising to Danny Baderas for going off because he couldn't feel his legs. And uh, I think that's a real insight into the, the special character of him. And... Uh, I think that's why it has really, you know, every injury like this is, a, is tragic. But this went beyond that because of the, the place he's held in the Knights players. I've been on the phone the last couple of days with his coach and my father-in-law, uh, Wayne Bennett. One, because of immediate concern for Alex, but also your concern for the people around him, and that included Wayne. But, mm. you know, Wayne's been a, a tower of strength from what I can see. But... He gave me a bit of insight into Alex because I, I'd only met him a couple of times. He, he'd come across uh, the first couple of times I'd been in his company is, is very mature and Wayne said that's one of his great strengths. You know, he can seamlessly bounce from hanging out with players his own age, you know, 20, 21, 22, uh, and can move in a, a circle of the senior players, you know, the likes of Danny Badiris and Bo Scott and Jeremy Smith mm. uh, without fuss. He's got great respect for those older guys. Mm. That's born out of a great respect for the game. Mm. He hails from a, a place called uh, Aberdeen up there in the Hunter Valley and he's from a rugby league family. In fact, as I understand it, the local rugby league field in Aberdeen is named after his grandfather. Mm. So you've got this rugby league family experience this uh, enormous pain at the moment. And to your point before about the the two little babies in the crib, you know, one putting the arm over the other and, you know, the sick one getting well. Mm. It's kind of what I feel the rugby league community is doing at the moment for Alex. And every, everybody is. Everybody's, you know, I can't watch that tackle anymore. I've seen it far too many times. Um, and everybody, yeah, it's something you know, everybody lives with in every sport. But to see it happen, uh, to be so severe, to see him in such stress on the field, to hear the impact. He's got feeling in his right arm. He can't feel his legs. It's, it's just awful. Well, we're not going to play the tackle on our no. show tonight out of respect, but we are going to talk about it because on the flip side of this, um, I could only imagine that there's a young man in Melbourne right now doing it really tough. Uh, so on the mechanics of the tackle itself, my personal opinion, having played and commentated on this game for a long, long time, is I've seen far worse. Mm. Uh, but unfortunately for, for Alex, I think as the tackle was unfolding, he anticipated that the tackle was going to be more extreme than how it finished. And he, he I don't know if you agree, but it looked as though he, he tucked his head to his chest yeah. in anticipation for a, a, a more vertical entry into the ground. And that's ultimately what got him in the awkward position. But... Yeah. There's a whole chain of events, Banton, from the moment of, of first impact to the moment that he actually hit the ground, where at, at any point along there, if something had happened slightly different, he would have, well, you, you'd like to think he would have just bounced up and, and been OK, but just certain things went wrong in the tackle and at every stage you can just see it getting worse and uh, unfortunately it wasn't fixed. Uh, nobody sort of recognised it. And it's... it's yeah, and I feel for Jordan McLean. Jordan McLean's a, a young kid. He's down in Melbourne. He's got no family in Melbourne. He's on his own down there trying to uh, establish himself as a footballer. Um, clearly, nobody intends for this to happen. And he's down there trying to deal with the fact that he played a part in this. I think the fact that the NRL has charged him with this, I'm really uncomfortable with. Uh, it basically in some manner of saying you're responsible for this. Um, I tend to argue that this, uh, this type of tackle happens quite regularly in a game where players are slightly lifted to try and unsettle them off their feet and get them to the ground. Um, the NRL is of the view that the, the arms were placed between the legs, so if there, even if there was no injury, 
that there still would be a charge. Well, why has it been referred? Explain that to me. Well, it's been referred. There's two, there's two reasons to refer a charge straight to the judiciary. One is that it's so severe that the charges, current charge sheet of gradings does not count for it, which is uh, what we see for a violent head-eye tackle or something like that. That's not the case here. This has basically been referred because they don't want to go through the process and basically extend the pain of everybody involved. We don't want Jordan McLean, you know, people being scrutinised, he's only been charged with this or that, um, people criticising the charge. They don't want the Match Review Committee to come under criticism for whatever they graded at. They don't want it held immediately while Alex McKinnon, most importantly, is still in hospital in a, an induced coma in a critical condition. So that they just want to just let everybody just focus on the priority, which is Alex McKinnon at the moment. This will be dealt with in due time. Yeah, sad all round. There's uh, no doubting this has been a, a terrible and unfortunate accident, but I've been reliably informed uh, by those that know Alex that he certainly has the character and the heart to face up to this very difficult challenge that has come into his life and on behalf of everyone here at Fox Sports and I think on behalf of all of Rugby League we wish Alex and his family all the very best in what's going to be an extremely tough time. Number is two and I'm saying years that Tinkler will continue to own the Knights. I think, I think he'll get through this year and I think this year might see him out. So that's so less. I think less, yeah. And what makes you say that? Because he no longer has the fortune he used to have and while he might be able to afford it this year, it has been a loss of $10 million, basically $10 million out of his pocket every year and I think at some point he's just going to say, you know what, I don't need it. I don't think it's that much but it's still a lot of money. It's still you, a lot of money. You don't make money out of rugby league. There's only a couple of people that can say that they do. Stay with us. Just ahead, we've got more on tonight's big stories. In sport, Newcastle's tribute to Alex McKinnon. Newcastle will dedicate its NRL season to Alex McKinnon. Matt Burke is here with all the details, Matt. It's a nice touch from the club, Sandra. As a tribute, McKinnon's name will be embroidered on the Knights jerseys for the rest of the year. A guard of honour will also be formed for Sunday's game against Cronulla. Liam Cox has more. Training with heavy hearts, Newcastle players struggling to comprehend the seriousness of Alex McKinnon's condition. You know, it rocks everyone, I think, and still, we're all in a bit of shock and a bit of disbelief, and I'm, I'm finding it hard to, to believe what happened. We've got to continue, but we'll never forget uh, Alex McKinnon. Judiciary Chairman Paul Conlon overruled the NRL clearing Jordan McLean to play for Melbourne this weekend. It's a tragic accident really and, and look I, I don't feel he's done a, a lot wrong personally if anything wrong. The NRL delayed McLean's hearing until Wednesday. Yeah, we did that on purpose. The rules once you do that mean uh, that we had to stand Jordan down. Through the appeal um, he, he now has the right to play on, on the weekend. Cameron Smith has been savaged for his handling of the issue. We, we, can't, we can't help when he ducks his head in the ground. It's unfortunate and I don't want to see that happen any time in, in our game. But if he doesn't duck his head, that doesn't happen. Oh, I, there has been some criticism about you obviously speaking to the referee during the incident. Yeah. Do you have any comments about that? No, I don't. Greg Inglis was the victim of several lifting tackles last year. It all happens in a split second, and he also ducked his head trying to protect himself. Mate, you just got no time to think in those circumstances, and, you know, it's an unfortunate event that it has happened, and, you know, my thoughts and prayers go to his family. McKinnon remains in a medically induced coma. Liam Cox, 10 Eyewitness News. Newcastle Knights players say they are struggling to deal with the shocking injury suffered by young teammate Alex McKinnon on Monday night. Ken joins me now and Ken, this will be a tough one for them to overcome. Good evening. Good evening, Peter. It's not just the Knights who are feeling the pain. Spare a thought for Storm forward Jordan McLean, who was involved in the tackle which damaged McKinnon's neck. Despite being charged by the match review panel, he's now being cleared to play against the Bulldogs in Perth. Emotions are running high in Newcastle. The Knights are playing for Alex McKinnon. We're a pretty highly strung bunch of blokes at the moment, so don't piss us off. They haven't seen their teammates since Monday's horrific accident. Forward Willie Mason says they are struggling to cope. We're all grown men, but this is this is something that's that, enough, that hasn't happened. You know, there's no manuscript to say how you got to feel. You know what I mean? He's one of our brothers. I love Alex like a little brother, so it sucks. Newcastle will play with McKinnon's name on their jerseys. They will retire his number 16 jumper. He's a champion young fellow, Alex. He's you know he's well liked throughout the team, and 
Um, he loves his footy in general. You know, he just he lives and breathes his footy, and I know it's, it'd certainly be a tough time um, for him. You know, going forward. Now, cleared to play this weekend, Melbourne's Jordan McLean travelled with the team to Perth today. Apart from McKinnon, he's the player most affected. Everyone's thoughts are with Alex, as I mentioned, but um, you know, there's a guy that um, you know, feels um, extremely you know, sorry for um, what has happened. It was an accident. I don't think anyone goes out there trying to hurt any other player intentionally. The Knights play the Sharks on Sunday. Despite their heavy hearts, the game goes on. It's been a rough trot for the start of the year for us as a team, but um, we've just got to move on. There's nothing else to do. We can't be walking around kicking stones. We've got to continue, but we'll never forget uh, Alex McKinnon. Erin Mullen, Nine News. And tonight on The Footy Show, Newcastle CEO Matt Gidley and former skipper and close friend of Alex McKinnon. Danny Baderis, live for an update on the condition of the young knight. And there's plenty of other stuff on the footy show as usual. But next, Jim Wilson with Sport and Jim the Knights pay tribute to their injured star. Yes, Mark, Alex McKinnon will be honoured for the rest of the season by Newcastle. We'll have the latest next as Jordan McLean flies to Perth with the storm, hoping a clash against the Bulldogs can be a welcome distraction. <laughs> Young Storm prop Jordan McLean will plead not guilty to a dangerous throw charge over the tackle that could end the career of Newcastle's Alex McKinnon. McLean will play for Melbourne against the Bulldogs on Saturday while he waits to front the NRL judiciary on Wednesday. Jordan McLean flew to Perth with the Storm after the club convinced the NRL judiciary chairman he should not be stood down when he wants to fight those charges over the tackle on Alex McKinnon. I think it was important for him to come. Um, obviously, you know, I think to leave him out it would have done him a lot more worse. But the Storm and Knights maintain McLean is not to blame for what happened. You know, it was an accident. I don't think anyone goes out there trying to hurt any other player intentionally. It was just an unfortunate, freakish incident. The incidents rocked the toughest Knights will now wear Alex's name on their jumpers. You know, I was on the field next, right near Alex and it's pretty horrifying what the words that were coming out. We're all in a bit of shock and a bit of disbelief and I'm, I'm finding it hard to, to believe what happened until, until I've probably seen. As the boys have already touched on, it's been an incredibly tough time for the Newcastle Knights and their young back rower Alex McKinnon. This weekend, will be he will certainly be at the forefront of the players' minds when they take on the Sharks and the team will have his name and his club number embroidered on their jerseys. Uh, his number 16 jersey will be retired for the season. As expected, the playing group in Newcastle is still very much coming to terms with this situation. It's unprecedented what's happened and how you got to feel in situations like this and you know Wayne rang me personally and I've rang, I've rang other young kids to see how they're feeling, young kids have rang me and um, you know we're all got to like you know we're all grown men but this is this is something that's had enough, that hasn't happened you know, there's no manuscript to say how you got to feel you know what I mean he's one of our brothers I love Alex like a little brother so it sucks. Oh, it's, it's, it's hard you know like even talking about it makes me emotional now so Talking about it before the um, before the game would be even harder. So I'll just shut my mouth and get on the field and let me uh, actions do the work. Well, fans are urged to send messages of support directly to the club, uh, which we'll get to Alex. Here is the email address: knights at newcastleknights.com.au. So it's certainly, Pete, going to be very difficult for the players to get out there. But they've already said this rest of the season is pretty much dedicated to Alex already. And I'm sure Kurt Gidley, when he comes on, will reiterate that as well. Thank you very much, Lara. <laughs> And all the girlies say I'm pretty fly for a white guy. Dobson flat, running over the ball. Bo Scott will take some stopping. They can't. Newcastle score first. Bo Scott runs into a hole. Running off Dobson. Scott looking to link up now. He scored last week. He's in again. Bo Scott. Two weeks in a row. Yeah, they have played better football than their results indicate, but after three rounds, they are on the bottom of the ladder alongside with this week's contestants, the Cronulla Sharks. So a huge game for both of these clubs, um, and especially in the aftermath of what happened last weekend. And we really appreciate Kurt Gidley making the effort to come down the M1 to, to catch up with us tonight. Good to see you, Gids. And Thanks, um, I have to ask you, emotionally, how are you and the team going to get up for this one? Well, mate, I think we should be able to get up for it pretty easily, knowing um, you know, our teammate and what he's going through at the moment and how tough of a time it is for, for him personally and his family and his girlfriend. Um, you know, I'd like to think me, well, I'm fine. I'll be able to get up for the game because um, you know, I know what type of black bloke Macker is and if anyone else was in his situation, he would do his absolute best to, 
to get a result that weekend. Has the coach found the need to have a chat to you as a group about how you're feeling mentally more than physically? Yeah, yeah, we had a chat this morning, but right, right from when it happened, um, you know, after the game, we, we took the bus straight to the hospital. We stayed on the bus, but the doctor, uh, football manager, Wayne, they all went in and um, you know, spoke to the doctors and assessed what, what was happening with Macca. And we've been kept up to date the whole, the whole time. The, the club's been really good on keeping us up to date and where um, the, the situation's up to and how he's travelling and um, how his family's going. And the support has just been outstanding from, look, our fans, um, I think the fellow footballers in, in, in the NRL, you know, past players and people who don't even know Mac. I've had text messages and calls during the week just, just calling up to see how, how I am and, mm. and, um, and just pass on their best, the best for him. Yeah, Kurt, it's... Uh, one of the great, uh, well, the greatest thing about the community up there is the tightness, as we know. And one thing I can guarantee, boys, on Sunday, it'll be an event. There's no doubt about that. And um, the community have got a great sense, and the team have a great sense when the community need a lift, and vice versa. And I, I, the, this horrible, this horrible thing with Alex, uh, it, it takes me back to in 1990, Kurt, when they had the Newcastle earthquake. A lot of people lost their lives during the earthquake and there was a feeling amongst the team that like, people sort of saying, you know, well, what meaning does this rugby league competition mm -hmm. take when this has happened? Every single game was like an event, like 30,000 people against people turning up and go, and, and the team responded to that. And I think this week, as in support of the team and the McKinnon family, I think, I think they'll, they'll shut the doors in the stadium. Yeah, well, I hope so. I think I, we've already felt that this week with the with the support and the emails and phone calls to the club from from our supporters, and we've got great supporters. We're um, we're going to retire Macca's jumper for the year, the number sixteen jumper. Retire that jumper and have his name and, and his club number on our jumper for the rest of the season as um, as a sign of respect and how much we we love him as a as a teammate. Well, also, you know, two very important competition points for both clubs here. Uh, the Sharks, they looked much better with Todd Carney back in the lineup last week. Andrew Fafida comes back as well. It is Sunday football out at uh, Hunter Stadium, or up at Hunter Stadium. Um, what's been the focus in the lead up to, to this? Well, obviously, Alex McKinney has taken a lot of the focus earlier in the week because the game was on the Monday night. But um, I think uh, I'd be interested in asking Kurt how he feels like you've been out injured for the last couple of years. You've had a couple of games back. We'll, we'll let the first one go. You've got a bump on that one. Hey, your own form, mate, uh, and your own progression this year. It's been good? You're yeah. making some progress? Look, I think it's, it's still going to take some time. Moving in, I've definitely played hooker at you know, certain times of my career, whether it be in, in rep teams or even at, at, um, for the Knights. But... I think it's a working progress for me and um, I think it's great to have Danny Baderas as part of, the, part of the club and part of the coaching staff and um, you know, all our hookers do some work with Betsy at the end of the training session and um, there's certainly still parts of the game that I need to, need to work on, that's for sure. But I'm, I'm, I've been enjoying moving into hooker. I like, you know, I like mixing it with the big boys um, on my team as far as you know, trying to drive those and motivate those guys to, to push past you know, what the limits normally would be. And I've, I've been enjoying it, but I, I still think, you know, it's a work in progress and I, I would like to stay there for the, for the whole year. Um, but, you know, we've, we've had an unfortunate start of the year yeah, with, with, with two of our, our starting backs um, ruled out with Mallow and, and Darbs. A combination that is in form, both Scott and Dobson out there on the right-hand oh, side. Is that something they've worked hard on like in the off-season? It's like twins, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Who's passing the ball to who? <laughs> <laughs> Bo's been outstanding. Um, you know, boy, dog, I leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, who, who's it a rap on and who's it not? I mean, sorry, did you? <laughs> well, you know, Bo's probably more known for his defensive role. I think you know, yeah. and he's. Um, I think he's a player that players don't like playing against because, um, you know, he's a he's a pretty tough character. But the lines he's been running there that we've seen, he's you know, his his running game has been outstanding, and I think that's um, it's shown. He's, he's he's got two of our our players player and equaled um, in one of the other ones, so he's been really good for us. What, what are the areas you are looking to improve on gigs? I, I mean, you can blame no Mullen, no, no, no Boyd. No, I'm, I'm, um, yeah, I'm not making excuses. Um, but I think defensively, um, we've leaked too many points. Yeah. And, you know, that's not where we want to be. We've been up around the high 20s, and that's, that's unacceptable for us as a team. You know, we, we, we were pretty good defensively last year, and we were keeping teams to, to um, a goal that we wanted. And that's been blown out over the yeah. first few weeks, and we need to get back to that and address that to start with. Well, it's a huge effort for you to be here tonight, Gids, and we, we certainly appreciate that, and we hope that the news that continues to come out gets better and better um, as quickly as possible. But uh, good luck on the weekend, and, and good luck with what's happening up there 
off the field as well. Yep, thanks very much, boys. Uh, uh, Kurt Gidley down from Newcastle. <laughs> Thanks for uh, joining us uh, in the studio and of course wherever you're watching in Australia and indeed around the world. Uh, it's, of course it's been a very tough and somewhat sad week for Rugby League uh, this week. We'll get to that in just a minute. Got to introduce our esteemed panel for the night, Michael Slater. Hello Michael. Good to be here buddy. We've got um, a bit of a wet round ahead of us I think with the rain in the air. Wet weekend, yes. Yeah, wet weekend. The big man, Daryl Broman joins us. Welcome Daryl. Hey, Brett Finch, one of the greats. Okay. The greatest ever, the immortal, Andrew Jones. Gordon Tallis is here from the Queenslander. And the lovely Erin Mullen. Nice dress. Thank you. Very Thanks, nice. Very nice. Carla Zampatti, good woman. Excellent. All right, right, this is going to be a bit tough for us uh, because, um, of course, we know what happened to Alan McSkinnon. It, it's almost like brotherhood. When you've played the game, you see what happens to a young man like this. Of course, on Monday night and Tuesday morning, we were all sobered by the news that Newcastle Knights Alex McKinnon had suffered a fracture of the C4 and C5 vertebrae in his neck following a tragic accident in the tackle against the Melbourne Storm. As we know, Alex is now in an induced coma with prospects for recovery looking at at least two years away. Everyone here at the footy show, and we all played the game, uh, sending our thoughts and prayers to Alex and his family. And, um, buddy, uh, absolutely concur with all those, but off the footy field, the footy show viewers have got to know Alex as a regular and popular member of Player Probe segment over the past two years. A down-to-earth hunter boy who loved a laugh and a bit of fun as much as his footy. So uh, he was a great character off the field. Yeah, and on the field, dynamic player. He destined for big things. Of course, he's a redhead. Uh, he followed Wayne Bennett from the Dragons to the Knights. Uh, he was the captain of the junior, junior Kangaroos a few years ago and has been doing great things up there at the Knights. Uh, in a moment, we'll be joined by Knights Chief Executive Matt Gidley and former teammate and close friend Danny Baderis, uh, who is now on the Knights coaching staff and was right there with Alex on the field on Monday night in Melbourne. But first, I want to bring in one of Newcastle's favourite sons, Andrew Johns. And uh, welcome, uh, Joey. And this is uh, this has hit everyone, not just up there in Aberdeen and Newcastle, but the whole rugby league world. Well, where's, uh, where Alex is from, he's from Aberdeen, which is a rugby league uh, town. I think it's only a place for about 3,000 the population. Um, I understand they're all devastated there. His family's deeply involved with, with the game up there. I think the, the, the local ground is named after his grandfather. Um, you know, the people of Newcastle, he's adopted home. Well, it's a rugby league stronghold, really. And I know people up there are absolutely devastated by what's happened. Uh, I spoke to her, a few of the players. They're, uh, they're in shock, really, the, the players and all the staff at the Newcastle Knights because uh, not only was he a player of, of great potential as a player, but as a young man, mm. um, he was just an absolute champion. And so I speak to Danny Vidiris quite a bit since it's gone on. And I think we all know about Danny Vidiris, what sort of person he, he, he is. And he absolutely loves Alex. He's devastated. And um, it's a really tough time for Alex and his family to imagine. So. Uh, you know, all our prayers go out to him, maybe he recovers. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Finchie, the, the other side of it is the, the tackler, and you've spent the week with the Melbourne Storm, and um, Jordan McLean, how, how's he travelling, and how's the team travelling? Yeah, um, I just got back today from, from Melbourne, being down there for the week, and uh, just echoing Joey's thoughts, you know, the, the whole... The whole club's, you know, just absolutely devastated what's happened to, to Alex and uh, certainly, you know, all our best wishes uh, go towards him and his family. But on the other side, uh, young Jordan McLean's really struggling down there and, um, you know, he's a big gentle giant, big caring sort of sensitive type of guy and uh, I know he's struggling as well. So, um, yeah, it's a, you know, this terrible, terrible accident affects so many people. I suppose what we're all looking for now is a bit of hope uh, for Alex uh, and his future. And uh, I don't know if we're going to get some joy from our next two guests, but uh, here's hoping. 
we get some. Uh, live from Newcastle is Denny Baderis. Of course, he was on the field. Newcastle legend. There he is up there. And joining us uh, now in the studio, the night CEO, we thank you for his time, Matt Gidley. Welcome, Matt. Wish we were talking to you about uh, happier times, but um, can you tell us the latest situation as of, um, as far as you know, of information you've received today? How is Alex doing in the hospital? Um, I mean, there's no further update at this stage, Fatty. I mean, Alex is still recovering from, from his initial surgery, which was Monday night, immediately after the, the, the incident. Um, so at the moment, it's been, yeah, I mean, it's been a really difficult week for everyone. Um, Obviously devastating news for Alex and his family and, and everyone involved in our footy club. I mean, um, as, as Joey, I think, touched on earlier, he's a really popular kid. I mean, um, you know, he's exactly the type of young player you want in your footy club. And we had hope, we'd, we'd hope that Alex was going to be a long-term player at our club. And we still, we still hope that's the case. But at the moment, all our, all our wishes and thoughts with Alex and his family at this, at this tough time. And his family flew down there straight away first thing Tuesday morning? That's right. So Alex's family arrived. Mum and dad. Uh, on the first yeah. Mum and dad and his girlfriend, Tegan, arrived um, first thing Tuesday morning. Um, and they met at the hospital with Wayne, um, our doctor and our footy manager as well. So, Danny, I'll bring you in, mate. Um, you were there. He, you're probably a mentor to young Alex. Uh, how are you coping and, and, and what was it like being on the ground when you saw him laying there? Yeah, it was tough. It was real tough, Slats. Um, we had, uh, obviously, a lot of the boys were concerned and until he did say those, those words that no one ever wants to hear on a football field that uh, really sunk in. and. Our game is that hard. We had to go into the half-time sheds and um, turn around and we lost one of our teammates and go out and perform. And Wayne asked for a response and the boys did get a response. And, um, yeah, it was just a, a really sad thing and an upset, upsetting thing to see. Yeah, Beds, whenever I saw you after a game, uh, whether it be socially or in the sheds uh, with the Newcastle boys, it seemed like Alex would always gravitate towards you. Alex, and I also used to notice Robbie Rocco would come up. Why, why was Alex so popular amongst all the players? Because Alex was just a big fan of life. He loved living life to the full and, and he just wanted to do anything he could to be a, a successful footy player. And he was well on the road to doing that. He had, um, everyone high, had high expectations for him and uh, we still do. So um, if anyone's going to beat something like this, it's going to be Alex because he's a, a real determined guy. Danny, did, did Alex get a chance to say anything to you? Did you speak to him either as he was going off the paddock or in the sheds? No, I, I sort of... I sort of backed right out, to be honest. I, I saw the, the help that he was getting and it was just the guys that were around there helping him were in the best in their field. And uh, it, it was tough to see him like that because when he did tap his chest, you, you heard the words of, you know, it's hard to breathe and, and things like that. So, mm. it, uh, you know, he went straight to hospital and he's getting the best possible care and, and his family's down there and our club, a lot of our club members are still down there as well helping out. So um, everyone's doing everything they can for him. Matthew. It's Finchy, mate. Though, just a quick one. How's the rest of the boys going, mate? How have they, uh, how have they handled the news this week? Yeah, it's uncharted waters, Finchy. To be honest, um, to be fair, our club's had a rough four months. You know, we've gone through a lot as a group. Um, we're on three. We've just lost one of our um, real popular players, as you know, and uh, we've we've got two of our best players out as well. So it's it's been a tough start to the season. It's only going to bring us closer together and, and that's what we love about our great club um, tragedies and things like this that um, happen in our game and in our society bring us closer together and I'm sure we're going to stick together like us and over Christians just do. Matthew, uh, and to make matters worth, um, he's in Melbourne, he's got no support staff, um, only his family. Um, is there a chance of the Knights bringing him home soon so the players can be sort of closer around him? Yeah, we hope so, Gordy. So we're, ju we're just waiting, as I said over the moment, to see what his recovery looks like over, over, the, next, over the next few days. Uh, we'd like to get him back here to the Royal North Shore as soon as possible so all the players and his family can, can get to him much easier. Um, at the moment, the players are even talking about flying down to Melbourne as often as they can on a day off, um, as long as Alex is in Melbourne. They're all desperate to get down and see him and uh, put, put an arm around his family. It's, um, yeah, it's a really important part. Of, uh, it gets close-knit knit community up there in Newcastle. What's the fans and the community response been like? It's been phenomenal, Joe. I mean, one of the, one of the, the reaffirming things about this tragic um, you know, matter is, is that the, the rugby league community is just phenomenal. You know, I mean, we, we, we turned around, um, you know, Wednesday and, and everyone had their hand up looking to help us out. I mean, the, the support that's come via our club that I've been able to pass on to Alex's family has been phenomenal. So it's, it, um, you know, I'm really proud of, of, of our game. And whilst we compete against each other on Sunday afternoons pretty fiercely, when it comes to things like this, you know, the support in our game is phenomenal. I'm looking ahead at this week, the guys, Willie Mason and your brother spoke today and, you know, the shock and 
Are, are you worried about you know their state of mind? And I mean, I know footy has to go on, but are you concerned about it? Uh, well, it's, it, is, it is a difficult time. I mean, we've got some processes in place, and if the players need some counselling to help them get through, I think that's 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 at the front of our minds. Absolutely, uh, we do have a game on Sunday. Um, the players will turn up. I mean, we're used to as a club, we're a pretty, pretty resilient footy club, so we'll roll our sleeves up and get the job done there. And I think um, you know the, the, the players will certainly do Alex proud, and um, the community will turn out and support. And we've got we've got a few initiatives in place on Sunday on how we can raise support for Alex. The jersey, I think they're wearing his name on the jersey and retiring. That's right. So the jersey Alex played it on Monday night was the number 16. So we're going to retire that for the rest of the year. Um, and the players um, will have Alex's name on their jersey this weekend with his club debut number on there as well. So. Uh... Have you go to the, uh, you go to the website there, Knights at Newcastle Knights .com .au, to for further details. Your coach Wayne Bennett, he, he doesn't get emotional very often. How's he been this week? Yeah, I think he's done it as tough as anyone, Freddie, yeah. to be honest. I mean, he's, um, you know, he's really close to Alex. Uh, I mean, he's really close to all of his players, but particularly Alex. Um, you know, they spend a lot of time together. So it's been really tough on Wayne. Um, you know, he's, he's spent a lot of time talking to the family during the, during the course of the week as well. And, and someone that's been in the game for so long has experienced so much, you know, the highs and lows in footy. I think this would probably rank, you know, right up there in the lows that Wayne's had experienced during his time. Yeah, Bench, you were out in the field uh, when all this took place. The medical staff of the Newcastle Knights, they were outstanding. Yeah, without a doubt, Joe, and Melbourne, the Storm guys obviously know Tony U pretty well and, and their doctor, they were out there and everyone's working together and, and that's the thing about our great game, when there is a tragic uh, situation, everyone bandies together and, and pulls through and, uh, you know, that's the thing about Alex, he loved our game and, um, and he still does and I'm sure everyone else does as well. What is Benny saying as coach, Danny? You're on the coaching staff now. Yeah, Wayne keeps uh, obviously saying it's uncharted waters to the boys and if you're emotional there, there are different avenues for you to, to let things out. Um, but just stick together and, and, do, and talk to each other a lot. But you know, if, if Wayne was meant to come here and, and win a competition, um, you know, maybe he's been brought here to get us through this situation. It's, it's a tough situation these last four months and um, I'm glad Wayne's at the helm. And thankfully it doesn't happen too often. There's been plenty of support from current players through uh, social media and that's a, a good thing that social media can do. It's an instant message and there's a, a lot of thoughts from the current players and there's some behind us right now. Um, Matt, I, I believe that when he was stretched off that the Chief Harrigan, the big fella, was there waiting in the tunnel and may have even grabbed his hand to give him some support. Yeah, I mean, Chiefs, you know, he's, he's the chairman of our club, but he's, um, you know, he's like the godfather as well. So whenever, whenever any of our players are injured, you know, he's the first there. So he was there waiting when Alex came off the field and took his hand straight away. Um, you know, Chiefs spent a lot of time with Alex. Alex, you know, a real student of the game. He loves Chief. He's mm. always quizzing him about the club and past players and all that sort of thing. So Chief was with him and Alex wanted him to stay with him as close as long as he could, you know, because his parents weren't there. It's just, it's just an awful situation. We all know that. I, I feel a bit for Jordan McLean in this situation too, and I know you mentioned it before. He must be going through hell. I really feel feel for that kid, you know, because we, we saw the tackle. Um, I reckon I saw a dozen yeah. a dozen tackles like that in that game, and it's just a terrible accident. I mean, yeah, yeah. And especially from that going point, through hell. That kid. from that point of view, from especially from down there at Melbourne, you know, their their first priority is Alex's health, and the, you know, the best wishes towards him. And you, you don't want to be too insensitive to that motorbike. Uh, you know, trying to, to back Jordan up so much in that situation too. But like I said, it just affects mm. so many people. It's terrible. All right, just to sum it up, um, as far as you know, he's, he's in an induced coma in hospital. So the doctors will just... How, is there a time frame as to when they'll take him out of that coma to, to make sure he can breathe all right and see if his back swelling goes down? Yeah, not that I'm aware of this stage, Fatty. I, I, okay. I do understand there's another round of surgery that was going to come um, possibly this afternoon, right. um, depending on whether an emergency had come in. So hopefully that, that second round of surgery has occurred this afternoon. That re the recovery can start post that surgery okay. and, then, um, and then we can see how things pro progress from there. Matthew Gidley uh, and Danny Baderas up there in Newcastle. Thanks both for your time tonight. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrible situation. Let's just uh, hope and pray, eh? That everything comes good. All right, thanks, Matt. Thanks, champion. Matthew Gidley, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, welcome to the Sunday Footy Show. As always, great to have your company as we dissect round four of the Telstra Premiership. And as of last night, no teams left unbeaten at this stage of the season, with Melbourne going down substantially over in Perth last night. And of course, St George Illawarra also being beaten on Friday night. Now, at the other end of the table, it's not often a month into a season, 15th versus 16th, 
carries such significance and importance as our television game does this afternoon. Both the winless sides, Newcastle, playing host to the Cronulla Sutherland Sharks up there and uh, important and significant in obviously so many different ways. And as uh, Tim just pointed out, we will be crossing to both Paul Harrigan and Danny Badiris uh, to get an update on things happening on and off the field up there. And we do take this opportunity, of course, to, to wish Alex McKinnon uh, all the best and certainly our thoughts and prayers with his family and his partner as well. A huge day up there and uh, we will get an update later on. All right, well, speaking of common sense, uh, Tim, what's coming up on the roast today? Oh, thank you, Peter. I'll give you the money later for that. I'm talking about the roast, not yet. It doesn't happen very often. The, uh, look, a very emotional day today up in Newcastle. Uh, of course, the Knights at home, they'll have uh, McKinnon's name on the jersey. They'll retire the number for the day. Great piece by Wayne Bennett. So we're going to talk about this issue on the roast today. No, you Three games left to complete round four of the uh, Telstra Premiership. One of those games, that television match coming out of Hunter Stadium this afternoon when Newcastle will take on the Cronulla side and uh, a lot happening up that way. I've got no doubt that the Roast boys have got a bit to say about that as well. Yeah, going to be a wonderful afternoon, Pete, of course, of football and a nostalgic and emotional afternoon, I would think, as well, both mm. uh, live and on TV. Make sure you check your local guides and be watching that this afternoon. It's going to be a cracking game of football. First up, the panel, Paul Crawley from The Telegraph. Good hey, to mate. see you, Paul. TK for the Big Sports Breakfast, the first mention of Big Sports Breakfast. Well, that's the second <laughs> mention. And Thank Brett you. Finch, how are you, buddy? Hey, Timmy. Now, first up, uh, look, on a serious note, I've just got off the phone to Tara from the Newcastle Knights and the update on Alex McKinnon. He is in a critical but stable condition in the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne. He has all the best staff around him and uh, that is the latest update. And what Taris did say to me is that as soon as Newcastle or the family get information that they can get out there, they will. So I know a lot of people in Australia are interested to see exactly what the, the next information is and as soon as they have it, they will give it to us. So, um, look, I think we all read Wayne Bennett's piece this morning, mm -hmm. a really touching piece behind the eyes of the young man and the kind of guy he was. Paul, he was... Uh, and, and like he, he took Wayne, he introduced him to Boost Juice and took him shopping. He was like real <laughs> insight into the young man. I'm so glad Wayne did the article. Mm. Like at, at times Wayne will not tell us what he really knows about people but when he does we always appreciate it and especially this week I know for a fact that he was really emotional when he rang up and made the uh, suggestion that he does the article and um, he calls him like his son and that's truly how their relationship is. I, I spoke to Wayne during the week and he said he is like my son. He yeah. said you know he said we do everything together there's nothing we don't talk about so he's been touched. Yeah I think a big thing in this situation football aside is the, the type of character and and person Alex is with the reaction from not only his teammates but the whole community um, on the on the footy show on Thursday night uh, we had Denny Baderas live from Newcastle and I've known Denny since I was 13 or 14 years of age and I've never seen him so car up and upset just so down in his demeanor and it just goes to show how highly these people think of him what type of character uh, you know, Alex is with the reaction from, from all his teammates and fellow peers. Yeah, I think it's also maturing too. Not only all the players, the coaches and the staff involved in the footy club, the Newcastle Knights, and the way they've handled it, but also the maturity in many, many ways about the, the rugby league community and the, you know, the fact there hasn't absolutely been mass hysteria about the actual tackle. There's been all the repercussions from that tackle, but I don't think anybody is looking to um, hang you know, Jordan McLean for what most people see as an accident. But... There are those other repercussions. You know, many people now are saying, you know, you, you've got to rule out the third man in the tackle. I mean, the, the reality is that there are 600 tackles made every game. There's close enough to 5,000 tackles made every weekend of rugby league. And I don't think you can go changing the entire fabric of the game because, unfortunately, one terrible, terrible accident. So I think the league are doing the right thing. Well, let's just hope that every bit of news now that comes out of Melbourne and comes out of uh, Newcastle and the family is positive. That's what we all Absolutely. hope and pray for from now on. Now, Paul, let's just isolate the tackle and talk mm. about the tin tax because plenty of people have tried to break it down. Tried. Uh, everyone wants to try to find someone guilty. It was a terrible, terrible accident, but it was an avoidable accident. If you look, Jordan McLean has hold of his leg. The two guys up top have hold of his shoulder. Alex McKinnon's been almost criticised for ducking his head and, and making the injury worse, he had no alternative. He had no control over his body but as his head ploughed towards the turf. That's the way the game is. You know, you can't go below the knees, so the third man in, that rule's changed, which you see 
a lot of people now left in the league, and you look to pin the arms. That's, that's the. That's I what know. I know. Oh, that, no, yeah, people are yeah, saying yeah, exactly. that Alex maybe caused oh, no, further yeah. injury by oh, ducking yeah, no, his head. No, he had no option. Yeah. yeah. But I look. I, I, I look. Let's isolate this away and just talk about that arm between the legs. And I know. And Freddie and I were talking about it before because a lot of players have their legs apart, so it, it makes it very difficult. Sure. But they have to go as hard as Hades on people that put their hand between the legs. It's just simple. They, they and they do. don't. They don't. Last night there was a tackle in the Bulldogs That's Melbourne right. game. It's Tim very Brown similar. upended, I think it was Brian mm -hmm. Norrie. Not even a penalty. No penalty, no nothing. They just play on. Well, here it is. There's the tackle. And, and it's not just similar, but the whole fact of the matter is when it gets to the judiciary, the Melbourne Storm will walk in with a whole list of grade one and grade two lifting tackles, which were very, very much what I think the grading of Jordan McLean's tackle will be. Obviously, unfortunate repercussions out of that grade one but that or grade is a factor, two. Terry. But the fact is, you can't change the fabric of the game. Everyone's yeah. saying, don't have a third man in. You know, cut out the cannonball tackle, bring the cannonball tackle back. The fact of the matter is, with all those tackles I mentioned, 5,000 a weekend. You know, very rarely do we see a horrific incident Actually, like this. Actually, I think you, you said 3,000 just before, but <laughs> you've just upped it by two. No, it's so 5,000. Yeah, it's just the same point uh, TK made. You know, they've taken away coming in and pinning the knees. Now they're, we've got people lifting the leg. What are you going to do? You people can't just stop well, let's, you can't let's go back to that. Let's go back to Greg Inglis last year because okay. we're all up in arms with that. Because yeah. there was two tackles in that Manly game last year. And I think we all remember that. Well, there was four times. I walked into that press conference after that game. Michael Maguire said. He said, Greg Inglis has been dumped on his head four times tonight. He said, we've got to do something to protect the players. Last week, we had Adam Docker upend James Graham. We had that tackle from Tim Brown last night. Are they doing enough to get rid of these tackles? I'll question that. And the other problem that Jordan McLean and Melbourne are going to have next week when they front the NRL judiciary is that it's actually stipulated in the uh, code of conduct for the judiciary that the severity of uh, injury actually... It, it will go to the sentencing. It, will, it, it yes, won't go to the grading so of it, right? It, it will go to the sentencing that comes from it. So, so the, the once it's a, once he's found guilty. See, many people. Well, Kate Snowden got seven weeks last year for breaking Ray Thompson's Yeah, but many, jaw. many people, I think it's a misunderstanding, Paul, and we might disagree on this. That this has gone directly to the judiciary because they couldn't find a grading. That's what normally happens, right? When oh, they can't the find yeah. a grading enough, right, they will then put it just straight to the judiciary. And that, I think that was the Cade Snowden one as well. This isn't this. This was out of respect of the family um, and, and the incident and the image of the game where it's the been directed. And, 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 we can, and, the thing yeah. is, and the thing is, we can forecast the postulate as much as we want at the moment. I don't know whether we're going to be able to isolate exactly what's going to happen. It's going to be a heavy night. There's no question. But how, if you don't have a third bloke in, how do you stop the One thing I do want to talk about is is Jordan McLean because he is a young man himself. He's a young footballer. He goes out with instruction. He's paid to do a job. You know him. You've spoken to him. How is he? Oh, the Melbourne camp was shattered during the week. Mm. The, the whole rugby league community was affected by this. And um, without a doubt, as we mentioned, you know, the first and foremost thoughts are with Alex and, and their family. But, you know, Jordan really struggled this week. You know, the, uh, like people have been saying, what should he be... You know, he, I think he's done nothing wrong. I don't really think he should get anything. That's my opinion. But... It was a terrible, terrible accident. And he's a big, gentle giant. And, you know, he, he's had a tough week as well. All right, well, speaking of challenges, uh, it is one of the great rivalries that we've seen in the game. Mark Carroll taking on Paul Harrigan, who's been good enough to lend us some time up at Hunter Stadium. And off camera, I have to say, Spud did say that every time he played against you, Chief, he got over the top of you. Your reaction to that? Hello, boys. Yeah, no, he probably did, mate. But, oh, um, that's not oh, the reaction. Oh, I, uh, did we just wake you up? or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'll tell you what, I, uh, I loved every minute with Spud and he, uh, he never disappointed on every game we played. He was always up, the big fella. But uh, the good thing is that, uh, you know, he's uh, in my mobile phone. His name's in there and we ring each other all the time. He's a great bloke. And that's one of the good things out of footy is uh, you get a bit of mateship. But I'm pretty happy. I've still got a headache from one of those collisions, I've got to tell you. <laughs> There's a couple of big ones. Yeah, there might be something there to forget. But um, I can see blue sky behind you there. and. We know that today is going to be a different type of day, despite the fact it is just a normal club game. Um, tell us about today at Hunter Stadium. Well, today is a club game, but you know we, we've suffered, you know, a huge tragedy this week, and uh, the club's had a lot of difficulty in dealing with it. And uh, I think we, you know, we've all been in the same boat. So as a as a town, we're just going to do um, as we're going to call it a rise for Alex. So as the two teams are out, and just before kick off, we're all going to stand up together as a group. And, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to give him an applause. But more importantly, we're just going to send our thoughts, our healing thoughts and prayers to, uh, to Alex. It's a big day for him today. And um, 
hopefully he'll uh, he'll he maybe come out of that coma and we might be able to see how he's going. So we're going to wear the jumper just with his name, just just for the boys, you know, to uh, just just to have him in the back of their mind, and also that number 16 jumper, which was his. We're going to retire that as well. So you know. We're going to play the game. Well, this year we've played with, we haven't won a game so far. That's that's a fact. But um, you know we've played with that with spirit, that Newcastle way, which we're all proud of. And there's been one thing or the other why we've lost a game earlier this year. And today's all about, you know, it's about doing our job and getting on with it. But uh, I've got to say, uh, it's really hard to get on with it. Um, everyone's been struggling with uh, with the thought of Alex, and, and nothing sort of seems to make sense at the moment. But um, they'll go out there and they'll do their absolute best. Hey, Chief, how has uh, Wayne Bennett, with all his experience, how has that helped having him around the club and in charge of the boys this week? Well, mate, it's been great, but uh, the one thing we can't forget is, uh, you know, he's human too, and um, he's been doing it really tough. He's very, very close to Alex. Um, very close, in fact. So, he, you know, he hasn't been himself, but as you would expect, uh, a bloke, you know, like Wayne, he's been rock solid, and particularly yesterday he was... Um, Outstanding and putting everything in perspective for the boys and getting them ready. Um, so he's been great. He's a tower of strength. He really is. Mate, just quickly, we won't keep you much longer. No, it's, it's a tough day for you, but um, remiss of me not to ask, as chairman of the club up there, will we see some resolution when it comes to ownership of the Knights um, in the near future, well, possibly this week? Yeah, probably in the next uh, the next week or two, there'll be uh, there will be announcement in respects to. Uh, a reformation of the club, uh, that's true. And it is quite a challenging time in its own right. But um, yeah, I would say time frame wise, uh, still if you're asking, probably the next week or two there will be an announcement. All right, mate. Well, I hope today goes as well as it possibly can up there. Um, and two competition points would be first and foremost there. We appreciate your time and good luck with what's happening off the paddock as much as what's happening on the paddock up there. Yeah, lovely. See you, boys. Hey, Thanks. Yeah, he's a great man, Paul Harrigan. And um, yeah, you can just you know, see there Somber, with his demeanour and, and in his voice. Uh, mate, it's tough up there. and um, you know, It's going to be a tough afternoon, but as I say, the best thing that the Knights can do for everybody now is to actually get two competition points. We'll break back shortly. Yeah, you can tell everybody, so wait and tell everybody.